Greetings, humans. You have entered the Command Zone, your destination for all aspects of Elder Dragon Highlander. Enjoy your stay. How's it, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Command Zone podcast. I'm your host, Josh Lee Kwai. And I'm DJ. And today, we're going to be talking about new cards. That's right. Yes. Forgotten Realms Adventures. Sorry, Adventures in the Forgotten Realms. Uh, it's right on the horizon. It's just recently been fully spoiled. This is the new Dungeons & Dragons set for Magic the Gathering. As you might imagine, because the way the set works is they're pulling a bunch of characters and things from Dungeons & Dragons. There are a lot of new legendary creatures. Yeah, a lot of them. Yeah, they're pulling famous characters from the world of Forgotten Realms. A lot of cool characters I'm happy to see because I read all the Drista Orden book books when I was a kid. Oh, nice. Um, so there's a ton of stuff to go through here today, but we're going to be talking about the multicolored commanders from the new AFR set. Before we get into it, though... If you want to build any of these decks, you're going to need the cards from Adventures in the Forgotten Realms. And the way that you get those cards is cardkingdom.com slash command zone. That's our affiliate link. When you use that link, you're going to get the magic cards that you were going to order anyway, but just simultaneously as gravy thrown in, you also support the all the content here at the command zone. It supports this podcast, extra turns, game nights, all of our stuff. Keeps our staff working hard, pumping out the content. And let's just say there's going to be a lot of content for AFR. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's a lot coming up. So all that help, all of you out there who order your magic products, singles, you know, booster boxes, bundles, collectors, boosters, whatever it is, when you use cardkingdom.com slash command zone, it really does keep the wheels turning around here. We really appreciate it. Um, and another way to support all of our content is by purchasing products from Ultra Pro. You know, Ultra Pro really does make the best stuff to protect your stuff. We've got some really cool play mats in front of us here. I mean, DJ, honestly, you have the gelatinous cube. Yeah, yeah. so the art and this stuff is amazing because a lot of it is just throwbacks to Dungeons and Dragons. And when you have cool art, you want to be able to show it off. And sometimes, you know, you can't just play gelatinous cube in every deck, but you can have it underneath your cards. You can show off the awesome art that you love by blinging out, not just your deck, but the table that you play on. Yeah. You can have it on your sleeves, on your deck boxes. Ultra pro has the IP. Uh, they, they, they license the stuff through wizard so they can use all that IP on all of their stuff. Uh, they also just make clip sleeves and other things that are timeless and will protect your cards forever. Uh, so again, Ultra Pro, great sponsor of the show. And then we did want to give a shout out because we have a special thing going on right now. Um, we have a new Kickstarter for our first ever Game Nights themed deck box. DJ's holding it right here. Yeah, it's made by Ultra Pro. It's super high quality, very sturdy. Uh, the magnets on the top are really, really strong. It has three compartments. It can hold two double sleeve commander decks. It also has a, a middle compartment that can hold dice or even a 60 card deck if you want to like bring your modern deck plus a couple of commander decks to F and M. Yeah, it's those magnets are so satisfying. Yeah, the magnets are very, very strong. They will definitely like keep your stuff safe. It's really classy too. It's got stitching. It's got the um, the Game Nights logo embroidered on it. Anyway, the Kickstarter is there's sort of two things going on with the Kickstarter, right? Because the way Kickstarters work, they're only for a limited time. But also, it's a limited supply supply product. We had to order the inventory up front, so we only have a certain amount. And in fact, it's it's possible at the time you're listening to this podcast that the deck box is already sold out. We don't know because we're recording this like a week ahead of time. Um, but if it's not sold out, you probably want to pause this video or this uh, audio recording. Click on the link in the description that brings you right to the Kickstarter and just lock in your order right away because we only have a certain amount, like we said, and once they're gone, they're gone. So make sure you go on over to that Kickstarter to get the deck box. All right. Uh, and the final way to support all our content is directly at patreon.com slash command zone. There's a lot of perks. One of the big perks is uh, we shout out one lucky patron on every single episode of the podcast. And this episode is dedicated to Andreas Mani. Andreas, you rock. Thanks, bud. Okay. Let's get into the, the multicolored <laughs> commanders for Adventures in the Forgotten Realms. Um, there are... There are like 15, 16 multicolored and like 14 monocolored, so we're going to split those up into two episodes. This is our first time discussing this set really on this show. We've done, have we done at this point uh, anything? I don't think we have. I think this is our first time. Anyway, uh, so we're going to talk about the new mechanics in the set really quick, and there's only a couple. Um, the first one is an interesting one. So it's a Dungeons & Dragons set. Dragons we already have in Magic, so that's not... Yeah, we have, there's going to be dragons in here for sure. Yeah, you know. but we haven't had a lot of dungeons. <laughs> 
Have we not had any dungeons? At all, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so there is a, a dungeon mechanic. It's called Venture into the Dungeon. Some cards will basically tell you to venture into the dungeon. Do you want to read one of the cards that ventures into the dungeon just for context here? Yeah, yeah sure. Veteran Dungeoneer. It's three and a white for a 3-4 human warrior. It's a common, so you're going to see this all over the place. Uh, when Veteran Dungeoneer enters the battlefield, venture into the dungeon. So, so cards will trigger, some you activate, some trigger like that, some like when you attack, you venture into the dungeon. But they will say something happens and then you venture into the dungeon. And the way that works in the game is that there are three dungeons. That's all there are right now. That's it. When you venture into the dungeon, if you're not already in a dungeon, then you can pick any of those three dungeons... And, and go into it. it. Those are not cards in your deck. They're not in your sideboard. They just exist completely outside of the game. They're, they're more like trackers. Yeah, you always have access to them. Yeah. And so you can pull whichever one out and be like, yep, this is the dungeon that I'm going into. Yeah, and the dungeons have sort of rooms in, in them. And if you're watching the video, you'll see all three of them uh, on screen. There's Dungeon of the Mad Mage, Lost Mine of Fandelver, and Tomb of Annihilation. Oh, I should say right now, like... Uh, I've played Dungeons and Dragons, but I'm not like huge, huge into how to pronounce everything. That's actually a big disclaimer in general is that, you know, we play a lot of magic and know a lot of magic stuff, but when it comes to lore, when it comes to pronunciation and stuff like that, a lot of you are going to be way bigger experts than we are. So sorry when we mis mispronounce <laughs> yeah, things. We yeah. might mispronounce things, but if there's cool stuff about Dungeons and Dragons, leave it down in the comments down below. It's like I read a lot of books, but they don't tell you how to pronounce the things either, right? Mm -hmm. Like you know, so when I was a kid, I read a lot of the books, so I know what this stuff is, but I don't know how to pronounce it. Uh, okay, so there's the three dungeons, and if you're looking on screen now, you'll see that they've kind of got different rooms in the dungeons and there'll be forks in the road to uh, you'll come to a point and you can go left or right um so when you venture into the dungeon the first time you choose one of the three anyone you want and then you go into that first room and it triggers and you get the effect so for instance dungeon of the man mage the first room is called yawning portal and you gain one life so when you venture into the dungeon the first time you gain a life then if you venture a second time, any other card just makes you venture into the dungeon. If you're already in a dungeon, you don't start a new dungeon, you continue on the current one you're in. So in Dungeon of the Mad Mage, you'd go to the next room, which is called Dungeon Level, and you would then scry one when you move into that room. Yeah, and you can't go backwards. You can't say, oh, I give up this one and start another dungeon. You got to keep moving. Yep. So you go through, and when you get to the last room, you'll trigger whatever the last ability in the dungeon is and then you will have completed that dungeon and so that dungeon card you don't need the tracker anymore it goes away and then if you were to venture into the dungeon again it would be just like you did the first time you can choose any of the three dungeons yes you can do a dungeon you've already done before and you go into the first room and you start over so like dj said you can't have be doing two dungeons at once uh, you have to complete the one you're in before you can start a new one but you can start a new one and yes you can do the same dungeon over and over all right, hopefully that explains it. We're not going to go through what every level of every dungeon is. Um, they have basically minor rewards along the way, and then near the end, and especially at the very end, when you complete it, you kind of get the big reward, and sometimes there's sort of decent rewards as you get closer to the end. Yeah. All right, the other m new mechanic, new mechanic, I'm putting that in quotation marks, yeah. uh, in the set is dice rolling. Now, it's not technically new. We saw it in, in unset before. Yeah. Uh, but these are 20-sided dice, so every card that wants to because 20 sided dice and rolling is just like intrinsic to Dungeons and Dragons so they really wanted to bring that to magic which makes sense so there'll be these cards and they will have you roll a dice for whatever reason and then you'll get different effects based on what you roll in general there's a fail so if you roll a, a low number sometimes it's just one sometimes it's one to five sometimes whatever they decided mm -hmm. and then there's like a an average case scenario and usually that's the biggest amount of numbers in the middle and then there's usually a crit which is if you roll a natural 20 or maybe sometimes it's like 18 to 20 or whatever it is if you roll a high number then you'll get a really good effect and you would as you would assume a low number gives you a worse effect and the average case scenario is well an average effect so let's read a dice rolling card just to give context yeah this is earth cult elemental it's four red red for a six six elemental this is another common so again you see it all over the place uh it has it is a siege monster Okay. When Earth Quilt Elemental enters the battlefield, roll a d20. A 1 through 9, each player sacrifices a permanent. A 10 through 19, each opponent sacrifices a permanent. And at a 20, each opponent sacrifices two permanents. So you can see there, that's a really good example. So a low number means that everybody's kind of the same because you have to sacrifice as well as your opponents. Yeah. Uh, um, a sort of 
a 10 to 19, which is like the hopefully the average case scenario or like a decently high number, means that only your opponents sacrifice a creature. But there's a crit. If you roll a 20 and that 20, then each of your opponents sacrifices two permanents, which is pretty good value. So there, it, it introduces a lot of variance. Um, it's going to be hard to evaluate these cards, I think, for that reason. I think you just kind of have to evaluate them based on the, the average case scenario. Yeah. You have to be okay with whatever you roll to include cards like this in your deck. Uh, one thing that's interesting, though, is that this has what looks to be like a like a keyword, but it's not a keyword kind of thing. Because it says, like, siege you know, monster. siege monster. And then it kind of goes on to explain what happens. Like, that's pretty interesting. They haven't done that before. Yeah, and we're seeing that a lot in this set where, like... Um, They'll have a modal spell, let's say, a spell that has, you know, choose one or choose two or whatever to choose one most of the time, uh, which normally in Magic, we would just say choose one here, this or that. But in this set, because it's Dungeons and Dragons flavored, they would name each of the modes uh, as probably after spells that like a wizard could cast or whatever um, in D&D, just to kind of give it the D&D flair, even though functionally they would operate the same as a modal spell. So I think there's a lot of that going on. Got it. So this Siege Monster text doesn't really do anything or mean anything, but it is definitely cool flavor, and it adds a level of depth to this card that, that honestly wouldn't be there otherwise. Okay. Those are kind of the new mechanics, so there's not a lot. Uh, so I guess we'll cover those as they come up for the commanders, and there are a couple. I mean, as long as we have Dungeons, Dragons, Dice Rolling, and Flavor, it's like... That's, that's what that's, the that's is, what right? That's what d is, right? Well, now so, we're going to talk it. about the characters, right? Which is yes. the other part. All right, so we're again, we're only going to go through the multicolored legendary creatures that are new to this set. Uh, there are a bunch, so let's begin with Barrowin, Barrowin or Barrowin? I'm not sure. Barrowin of Clan, Clan Undur. It's uh, two white black for a legendary dwarf cleric. It's a 3-3. Three, three. When Barrowin of Clan uh, Undur enters the battlefield, venture into the dungeon. Whenever Barrowin of Clan Undur attacks, return up to one creature card with mana value three or less from your graveyard to the battlefield if you've completed a dungeon. All right, so it's our first one, and it is a new mechanic. This is an uh, uncommon um, legendary creature. Wants you to have completed a dungeon before you really get much. I mean, you're going to get some amount of value from the first ETB venture, right? Yep. For sure. Uh, let, I'm just going to read what the first room is in each of the dungeons just so we have an idea. So in Tomb of Annihilation, each player loses one life. In Dungeon of the Man Mage, you gain one life. And then in Lost Mine of Fandelver, you scry one. So it's a pretty minimal effect. I would say that all that stuff is worth like not much, right? It's one life either way. And then scry one's probably the best of those. Yeah, that's, first, scry one's like a third of a, third card. Of a card. Yeah. So it's not a lot of value on... Uh, Barrowin, but what you want to do is have completed a dungeon uh, as fast as you can so that now her ability to sort of uh, recur creatures from your graveyard is turned on. Yeah, getting that three mana value creature back, you know, every single time, that is a card's worth of value. And so this can, if you accelerate through the dungeon, really bring back value over and over again. Yeah, so it's interesting. Rather than like venture into the dungeon a lot, Barrowin wants you to complete a dungeon, and then after that, doesn't really care much about dungeons, right? It's just a, did you complete? Yes, okay. Second completion of a dungeon doesn't do anything for you. Which is really interesting, because dungeons are different lengths, and, you know, one dungeon that has a really long one, Dungeon of the Mad Mage, it's a really long dungeon, it's the longest one, has a really big payoff at the end, but it takes forever to get through it, uh, and so you won't be getting the secondary, you know, reanimation effect off of this for a really long time, and so maybe you want to go for a shorter dungeon, uh, and the so the lowest number you could go through is three, but actually like you hurt yourself as you go through that dungeon. So there's this interesting push and pull between what dungeon you choose. Yeah, so there are the three dungeons. Dungeon of the Mad Mage, it takes you seven ventures, I think. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven to complete. That's the most. Lost Mine of Fandelver is one, two, three, four to complete it. Tomb of Annihilation is an interesting one because it has two paths and they're different lengths. So the safer path is four to complete. And the not safer pass is only three to complete. So if you venture once with borrowing, then if you just venture two more times, you could technically have completed Tomb of Annihilation and turned Barrowin on for the rest of the game for you. But let's read Tomb of Annihilation and the fast path mm -hmm. just so you get an idea of what you'll have to do. So step one is each player loses one life. Step two, the room is called Oubliette, and it is discard a card, sacrifice an artifact, a creature, and a land. Oof. 
So if you want to take the fast path through Tomb of Annihilation, you have to be willing to discard a card, sacrifice an artifact, a creature, and a land. Not or, and. So that that is a lot, but you might, you know, you might tell yourself, I'm going to get one of those back next turn when I attack. Right. Barwin's <laughs> going to get you a creature back. So maybe it's only, and then maybe you discarded a creature. So maybe two yeah. things can come back, but the land you're, you're losing forever. That's rough. Yeah. Yeah. And you have to sack an artifact too. Um, and then it goes to the final room and it's called Cradle of the Death God. And you create a legendary 4-4 Black God horror creature token with death, death Touch. So at the end of it, you get a 4-4. So maybe you get that one creature back kind of in that way. And then, I don't know, we're talking yourself into it. That's the <laughs> fastest path you can go to get to a complete dungeon. I don't know how worth it it is. This might be, it's a it's a, re, uh, uh, a commander with um, Graveyard Recursion on it. So it might be an aristocrat style deck where you don't mind sacrificing things. So maybe it's okay. Uh, I think that also it has to do with how much dungeon support you have. Because if you are powering through dungeons you need a lot of dungeon matters cards in your deck and they only come from this set you know and the the yet to be talked about commander sets uh so there's a limited pool of dungeon matters cards and so you can kind of look at your commander deck and see how reliably you can move through a dungeon you know whether you can churn through them really quickly or whether you know it's going to take some hoops to to get through yeah we we read that common veteran dungeoneer earlier but there's also things like dungeon map in the set which is a three mana artifact that taps for a colorless or you can pay three and tap it to venture only at sorcery speed so it's a way just for mana to do it mm-hmm. there's also equipment that say when you attack venture into the dungeons called delver's torch so there is stuff you could put in your deck to help you venture more my feeling is that borrowing ventures on its own and you can probably make it with cards that you would just play in your deck so that I'm going to venture to completion only using borrowing. Yeah, I think you could do that too. So if you do that with like blink cards, white can blink. So if you play something like Eldrazi Displacer or uh, Ephemerate, Ephemerate does it almost by itself because it uh, rebounds and then does it again. Yep. Uh, Again, that's only Tomb of Annihilation if you're willing to discard the cards and sacrifice the stuff. Um, There's also things like uh, reanimating borrowing, so letting it die or her die when she dies and then saying, oh, I'll reanimate uh, or animate dead to get another venture into the dungeon. That synergizes as well because you'll want things in the graveyard anyways to bring back with Borrowin. Yeah, exactly. So I, I could see Borrowin say, being like, yeah, I'm going to play it and I'm going to have a bunch of things because all that other stuff, Ephemerate and Eldrazi Displacer is probably good with other things in your deck to have ETBs and now you're not just playing like these venture cards that kind of do nothing once you've completed the dungeon. Yeah. Yeah, that feels like probably the way you're going to go. I thought maybe this could be like a Hate Bears deck. Because hate bears are usually low CMC, and the fact that they'll be hard to get rid of because you can just keep bringing them back. And it also kind of protects Barwin because if you've got like a Dranith Magistrate out, yeah. people are going to kill that before they kill your commander. But <laughs> then you sure. attack with your commander and bring it back, it makes it really tough on them. Uh, Avon Mind Sensor makes it hard to tutor. Thalia, Guardian of Thraben makes spells cost more. Um, Esper Sentinels are a really good one uh, that I think we're going to be seeing a lot of play that just draws you cards or taxes them on their non creature spells. Um, you put Grand Abolisher. Like maybe Barwin goes in a Hate Bears deck that has more colors, mm-hmm. like one that Jesper Icing might play on one of our <laughs> extra turns. Then, because Barwin can bring back all his Hate Bears, he might like that. Um, Call me the False Hope I really like, because this is a card that, uh, here, I'll read it. This is a card that costs one mana for a 1-1, and you sacrifice it, prevent all combat damage that would be dealt this turn. So with Borrow In, this becomes kind of like Fog Frog. Yeah, for sure. Right? It's just sitting on the table, and if anybody happens to attack you, you sack it, and you can always get it back with Borrow In. But also, what you'll find is that when you have something like Spore Frog out, then people just don't attack you, so you don't actually have to sacrifice it, so then you can recur other stuff. Yeah. I, I can see this with a lot of different things. Like, obviously, if you you would lean into this by playing something like Sun Titan in your deck, too, to get more stuff back, Luris could also let you cast some of the small stuff from your graveyard, too. Yeah. And so you can have this deck that uh, really churns through your graveyard and uses that as a resource. And you're not necessarily racing through the dungeon. You're just ending up going through the dungeon and getting that value as you go. Yeah. Uh, Selfless Spirit's another one I like. It's a 2-1 that you can sacrifice on creatures you control getting indestructible until end of turn. Stitcher Supplier enters the battlefield or dies and you mill three cards. That's a way to just get more creatures into your graveyard so you have more choices with borrowing. Because one thing with this type of recursion is it starts to become like tutoring because you've got so many things in your graveyard that you're not just like drawing a random card. You're picking a card for the situation you're in. And also it's cheating mana, right? Because it's putting the card onto the battlefield. So it just really depends on how 
reliably you can complete a dungeon. Because if you haven't completed a dungeon, then Barwin is pretty bad. Yeah, because right? you Just go into the point. room and you get like it's this really minor value, you know. So you really do need to make sure that you go through the dungeon so that your commander can kind of be turned on. Yeah, so you need enough blink and reanimate effects to probably sacrifice outlets. Well, stuff. once once it is turned on, I mean, there are some pretty powerful abilities. We can copy them. You know what yep, I mean? Yep. So we can copy, you know, the triggered ability of it, you know, entering the battlefield oh. and venture, venture multiple times. Or we can copy the triggered ability of it attacking and get more than one, you know, three drop back from our graveyard. So, yeah, Strionic so Resonator, copy. Lithoform Engine will do that. That's pretty smart. And it copies the ETB venture, too. So that's good. Uh, yeah, this is probably like an Aristocrats deck then at that point, right? Like you're getting... Because all the Aristocrats pieces like Zulaport, Cutthroat, Blood Artist, Vis- Viscera Seer are all 3 CMC or less. And the ability to just kind of sack them and then bring them back mm-hmm. is like what that deck wants to do. Um, so I guess once you put it into those terms, it's black, white, possibly Aristocrats. It's less exciting. I know, right? Because it's something that we've seen before. It relies less on Dungeon, which is the cool new mechanic. And then you know, your mind starts reaching out to other black-white commanders, you know? All right, well, let's go to the next um, commander, which is a Boros commander, and I think we're going to say similar things because it is a Boros equipment commander. Never seen that before. All right, (laughs) it's Brunor, Battlehammer. Brunor, one of the major characters from the Drist Orden books by Ari Salvatore. Two, a red and a white for a 5-3 legendary dwarf warrior. Each creature you control gets plus two, plus O for each equipment attached to it. And then you may pay zero rather than pay the equip cost of the first equip ability you activate each turn. So it only reduces the cost of one equipment per turn, uh, but it gives that nice power boost for each equipment on the commander. Does this change what our Boros equipment decks kind of already look like? I think there are some interesting things going on. So it does, it does apply this to other things. So like your commander might be delicate going into combat, but this does up give the plus two plus O to any creature that's equipped. Right. So you can have it on like a flyer, some sort of evasive creature, something like that. Uh, Here's the thing. Boros equipment, we kind of groaned at it because it's not very interesting. Pumping power is not very interesting. Equipping for free is something that we really like in those equipment de- decks. But there are a lot of effects that do but it already. Other, yeah, we have other stuff that, that does that too. Um, it is good. Yeah, it could, it could potentially be good. I mean, it doesn't have card draw. It has a little bit of ramp on there if you consider like skipping the equip cost ramp, which are the things these decks usually want. I mean, I think the interesting stuff is you're going to want specific equipment. Like Once you want equip cost a lot to equip so that you can cheat cast. that. Yeah, so yeah. you can cheat the mana because, you know, just having an attacking commander is is fine. Attacking's good. But really card draw and ramp are really important. And if you can cheat mana in some way, we know that cheating mana is powerful. So using the equip cost and cheating that mana value seems important. Right. So, so like Colossus Hammer is one mana, but it's eight to equip. Ooh, you're right. Cheating eight so, mana to get it onto something. That's yeah. Huge. So you, so it's, it gives plus 10 plus 10 and the creature loses flying. So it would make Brunar, uh, a 17 power creature because it would still get the plus two plus oh yeah. it would, colossus hammer would almost be lethal on bruner right like that yeah okay, that's pretty cool yeah and you <laughs> and you basically get eight mana because you skip the equip on it which is cool uh scythe of the wretched is two mana four to equip it gives equip creature plus two plus two but it says whenever a creature dealt damage by equip creature this turn is put in a graveyard return that card to play under your control so it makes it really hard for them to block uh but they're going to have to block because you just attack twice huge. and yeah. like, yeah, you die. Uh, and then you attach the scythe to the creature that got brought back. Um, so it's, it's, I don't know, like, is that exciting enough or different enough? There's other cards we wrote down like Blazing Sun Steals, Seraphic Greatsword, Blade of Selves has a high equip cost. Mm-hmm. Um you know, is that exciting? Blade of, I like Blade of uh, about, But like, it doesn't work on Brunar, right? Because it's yeah, Myriad right. makes it legendary creature tokens. What's the other one that makes the copy of it? Helm of the Host. Helm of the Host to make more sure. copies and then and then things they that get are plus, plus four, plus, 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 four, plus, four, plus oh. And you can equip two things for free per turn. Like, that's something. But sure, Helm of the Host, congratulations. We I broke know, right? it. <laughs> like, it's already a really good card. I just don't know that this card gives enough new stuff to make it super exciting. I mean, obviously, you're still, still going to play Sunforger and the Sword of series, probably Sword of the Animist. Um, I think the other way you could go with Brunor is like the Cheerios route. So play all the really cheap equipment, and you're not relying on that equip uh, co- pay, pay zero for your equip cost as much. And you're saying, what I want to do is stack a bunch of bone saws and stuff 
onto a single creature. Just like one healing hawk or something. Yeah, like that. so I get like, four equipment onto something that's plus eight plus oh plus whatever the equipment gives it, you know, and then but again, I don't know that that is like a Kiri just seems better, right? Draws you cards, yeah, and gives you bonuses for uh, equipment. So Bruno, unfortunately, I just don't think is a that different than what we've already got, and b probably less powerful than what we've already got. Yeah, I think that having this in the ninety nine is great, and I think maybe saying, okay, I'm gonna take my equipment deck, and at some tables I'll slot it into commander, and at other games I'm like, okay, I'm gonna bring my more powerful commander in, or you know something like that. But definitely has a place in a lot of decks. That'd be interesting, right? You build a deck, and it has like the four or five of the possible Boros equipment commanders and you just sort of shuffle them up before each game and you don't know which one it is. The rest go in the deck and you're like, okay, this game, this person's the leader of the deck. I like that. Yeah, that That's might be cool. fun. Uh, okay, let's go on to the next one, which is one of my favorite characters in all of D&D and I'm not alone. <laughs> if, if people know one character from D&D, I'd say it's probably this one. Yeah. It's Drist Dorden. Uh, three green white for a three three legendary elf ranger has double strike five mana three three double strike when Driss ETBs it creates Gwenwivar a legendary four one green cat creature token with trample so five mana three three double strike comes with a four one with trample <laughs> man we have come a long way in magic let me okay, just right. say and then it also has more upside whenever a creature dies. If it had power greater than Driss power, put a number of 1-1 counters on Driss equal to the difference. So if a 6-6 creature from any player dies while Driss is out, Driss gets 3 plus 1 plus 1 counters. Remember, has double strike, so that's big game. That's huge. So Driss is super interesting um, because it creates a token, but it's a legendary token, so you don't necessarily want to be like blinking Driss a lot to like try and get more tokens. Has double strike, as you would expect Driss to, because he's well known as a dual sword wielding, what is it, Twinkle and Icing Death, I think, are the two swords. Ooh, good job. Gosh, I hope I'm right about that. <laughs> uh, and then, I haven't read the books in like 15 years, maybe 20. Um, and then can grow when other creatures die. So, you know, I think double strike, obviously is really good with things, things like the Sword of series because yeah. you get double triggers. Absolutely. So they're on hit, sort of Feast and Famine. Maybe that one's less good because you untap lands twice, which is hard to take advantage of unless you have instants. But Hearth and Home is a new one that... Have you played with Hearth and Home? Much? Yeah, Hearth and Home. Cards but you mentioned it's hard to blink this one too. Right, you probably have other but creatures yeah, have in your deck. Too, yeah. yeah. Um, plus just nice, getting though. two draw lands two is good for Hearth and Home. Yeah. Fire and Ice, draw two cards, deal four damage. It sword of the Animus is on attack, not double, but you probably still play it. Uh, Truth and Justice, you oh, can proliferate yeah. the plus one plus one counters on it and and put in other places, so that could be pretty cool. That's I mean, good. they're all good, honestly. Yeah. Like we mentioned, Feast and, Feast and Famine isn't that good. Like, it's still great. You You're know? still putting it in the deck. <laughs> because I put it in decks where the creature doesn't have double strike. Uh, then there's that second ability when a creature dies, and there are ways to take advantage of this yourself. There's some interesting ones. So Phyrexian Dreadnought is a card people are talking about. It's one mana for a 12-12 with Trample. But it says when... It, it enters the battlefield. You, s you have to sacrifice any number of creatures with total power 12 or more, or you have to sacrifice Phyrexian Dreadnought. Here's the thing. You play it for one mana, sack it, and then you have nine counters to Driss, and that's lethal on yeah, somebody. Yeah, Driss is a 12-12, <laughs> double strike, and they die. So that that's pretty cool. Force of Savagery is similar. Two and a green for a, uh, an 8-0 <laughs> so with weird. Trample. Yeah, an 8-0 with Trample. So it comes in and immediately dies, but that's five counters yeah. onto Drist. Um, I thought Evoke could be kind of good. So like uh, Cloud Thresher is two green, 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 green. So six mana for a seven, seven flash and reach. When it ETBs, it deals two damage to each creature with flying and each player. But you can evoke it for two green, green. So for four mana, it comes, comes in, deals the two damage to each flyer and each player. And then you have to sacrifice it. But that is a creature that died and will put four plus one plus one counters on Drist. Walker of the Grove, kind of similar. Um, any of those creatures that kind of come in and die immediately in some way, if they're big, that can be like, that can make Drist like pretty quickly kill somebody. Yeah, you, that's definitely accelerating Drist for sure. Because like my my thought was, oh, I'll kill my opponent's creatures. But how big of a creature are my opponents going to have? Drist will end up with like one or two counters on it. You are going way bigger, way faster, really pressuring your opponent's life total. 
Yeah, and the bigger Drisk gets, the less likely it is your opponents will have a creature that's bigger than that, right? Once it gets to six or so, it's just, you know, what are they going to have? An Ulamog, which you can't kill anyway. You have to exile or something. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, by the way, I should say, this is the... Um, this is a deck that was built for the next game nights. Lady Danger plays it on Ooh. that episode. Uh, another cool mechanic, I think, with Drist is uh, the fight mechanic. So often we try and fight creatures and we try and kill their creature without ours dying, which would be fine. Drist probably gets some counters. But you can also like fight your own creature with theirs where they'll both die. Mm. Or maybe you know your creature's a little bit bigger. A Cogla is a fight um, card that you can play in the deck. Seven, six, four. Fights when it ETBs has some other abilities. This yeah. would be a way for either Cogla to die or a bigger, you know, a seven power thing to die. Well, you imagine like, okay, I'm going to Cogla fight your thing. Oops, my whatever dies. If Cogla ends up dying, that's fine. You've cleared the way and Drist is now seven double striking. Yeah. That's dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. Brutal. So that's pretty cool. Um, other ways to sort of pump Drist up are like Berserk. This is a card that... Um, you talked about adding to the deck before we shot game nights. It's really good. Yeah. Uh, Berserk is a one mana uh, green instant. Cast Berserk only before the combat damage step. Target creature gains trample and gets plus X plus O until end of turn, where X is its power. Uh, at the beginning of the next end step, destroy that creature if it attacked this turn. So Berserk actually has a lot of different ways to make Drist good. Of course, we're focusing on uh, making sure that its power gets even bigger. If it's already big, it can get even bigger. And then it's double strike, and then trample actually lets that damage get through. So just on its face value, it's just a really powerful combat trick. Uh, but also, this can be used on your own other creatures. Your opponent's creatures. Yeah, you can use it on all your, or your other creatures or your opponent's True. creatures. But just imagine, you know, someone's attacking with something, someone else. You know, Jimmy's attacking Josh, and I... I basically berserk their 5-5 five five, and suddenly it's 10 damage dealt to Josh and then that creature has to die at the end of, you know, berserk kills it and then when it kills it, it'll then put all of those added power counters onto your Drist. Yep, because it was huge when it got, when it died because it was, the power was doubled. Yeah, that's why I love berserk uh, and when you suggested it, I was like, oh yeah, that card is super good because the fact that you can use it on offense and or quote unquote defense as a removal spell against your mm -hmm. opponents makes it really, really good. Um, you could also sort of play with the plus one, plus one counter thing. We won't talk about a lot of specifics because that archetype is known, but hardened scales and that type of stuff, you can maybe go in that direction with Drist. Yeah. Move counters around. Maybe it's easy to put counters on. It's easy to put a few counters on Drist. And then once there, you could just be like, well, when I put a few, I can get a lot more yeah. through these other effects. So you can move them off and then keep putting more counters on Drist, things like that. Uh, and then some Voltroni board wipes, I think, are important. So Tragic Arrogance, which lets you pick which permanents everybody keeps. You pick your Driss, one sword, you know. But your friend dies. Yeah, Gwenevar, that's it's Gwenevar fine. dies. Gwenevar just goes back to the Shadow Realm or whatever, and you just summon her again later. Uh, okay, cool. Uh, Fell the Mighty, <laughs> I think, is a really good one. So it is four and a white for a sorcery. Destroy all creatures with power greater than target creature's power. So only the creatures that will pump Driss will die. So you go, boom, fell the mighty, whatever died, I get a few counters, and then... Drist is huge. Yep. <laughs> and it's the biggest thing on the board, and it just kind of magically grew to be um, just amazing. Uh, Promise of Loyalty is one, uh, sort of a newish one. It's four and a white for a sorcery. Each player puts a vow counter on a creature they control and sacrifices the rest. Each of those creatures can attack you or planeswalkers you control for as long as it has a vow counter on it. So it leaves behind one creature per... But those creatures just can't attack you, which is great. Now that make might make it hard for Drist to uh, swing, but probably enough creatures have died that it's a little he's a little bit bigger and can get in there. You know, and you know, letting uh, people spread around damage is pretty good in your deck because this is sort of an attacking damage based deck. Yep. All right, so Drist cool Voltron deck. Uh, just like many Voltron decks, it will be susceptible to, um, you know, you removing the one big creature that you put all your resources into, so watch out for that. But I think Drist is, is, can be interesting, can be cool. I don't think it's going to be, like, top tier or anything. No, but it's fun. Yeah. I think that things that smash people out of nowhere, like, can be really exciting. So I think that that's great. All right, let's go on to the next one. Who is it, DJ? It's Faraday Devil's Chosen. It's two blue-red for a 3-3 three, three legendary Tefling Warlock. Tiefling. Tiefling, Tiefling Warlock. Uh, it has devils. Uh, it has... Dark One's Own Luck. Dark One's Own Luck. That's <clears throat> kind of a saying. Yeah. It has Dark One's Own Luck. Uh, whenever you roll one or more dice, uh, Faraday Devil's Chosen gains Flying and Menace, Menace, until end of turn. <laughs> if any of those results are 10 or higher, 
draw a card. Okay, so whenever you roll dice from something else, Faraday yep. doesn't let you, doesn't have a mechanic on her that makes you roll dice. Nope, Faraday can't roll any dice, but other cards can make you roll die. And so if you roll, you know, anything, anything flying in menace. Okay, and if you roll a 10 or higher, since all the cards in AFR that dice roll are D20s, yep. you get a... Basically, that equates to about half a card when you roll a d20. Yeah. Right? 10 or higher. It's a little over, right? Because you actually get the 10. That's right. So, whatever percentage that is. Oh, gosh. It's like, you know, 40 or 55% chance or something like that. Anyway, don't quote me on my math. So, how many... <laughs> we, we went through and uh, actually DJ went through. I won't take credit for this. And looked up... Um, how many dice rolling cards there are in this set that either roll dice or give you a payoff for rolling dice that are can be played in a blue red deck? Yes, there are twenty three new dice rolling uh, mechanics or something that synergizes with dice rolling uh, in AFR. Uh, now, one thing to note is that uh, the commander sets have not been spoiled yet, uh, but on the face commander of one of them, it it says you know rolling dice, so that we know that there will be some dice rolling some somewhere in those sets. So it's hard for us to predict at this moment uh, how many... Because there's new cards inside those commander decks. Yes. So presumably there will be some new dice rolling cards in there that aren't in it in the main set. We don't know for sure, and we just don't know how many. This We're trying to figure out how viable a dice rolling deck is because since dice rolling hasn't existed for a long time, it's kind of like venture into the dungeon. Is there a critical mass, enough of them, so that you can actually make a deck built around this mechanic work? Uh, 23's... Sounds high, but you have to realize like a lot of those are like commons and, and not cards that we would consider like good enough to be played in commander under normal circumstances. Yeah, but the commander precons, those could have a lot of cards that are really viable in commander. We just don't know what's in there, but we know that there's at least, you know, something that Probably. deals with dice rolling because we know the face commander of the gruel deck. You know, right. green doesn't match up, but there's red in there, you right. know, and so that we know that at least in that deck oh, there right. will be some it's dice gruel. rolling. Yes. So even if there's five or six new dice rolling cards or whatever number there is, we don't know again, um, then it would only be the mono red ones exactly. that you could play. So probably not. Yeah, so we're not, not, we're not thinking about 10. Deck. We're thinking yeah. about like, we're just estimating like maybe five. Jeez, that seems high. If it's got to be mono red, I would say two or three if we're lucky. Okay. Uh, again, I don't know that ticket all. So I, I, you know, maybe there's some artifact ones or something. Maybe we'll get lucky and there's four or five. Yeah, maybe. But, so, so it's interesting. The, the thing I immediately thought of was, well, dice rolling has existed in Magic one other time, but it was not, it was a silver border set. It was unstable. So let's say we rule zero conversation before the game and we say, hey, I'm going to play Faraday, which is a dice rolling commander. Is it okay if I have some silver border cards in my deck just so I have enough dice rolling to make this work? If we said that, how many cards in unstable have dice rolling on them? Uh, actually, like a surprising amount. There are 27 uncards uh, okay. that have you rolling a dice, but most of them have you rolling a D6, and they explicitly say D6 or synergize with D6. And in this set, it's D20, and your commander triggers off of a roll of 10 or greater. So when you roll a D6, D6 Faraday could never draw a card, obviously, because you yeah. can't draw, <laughs> you can't roll a 10, but it would still get the flying in menace. Yeah, I guess. still get the flying in menace. Do those cards in unstable? Do they care? Like, do, would they trigger off me rolling a d20 for the uh, other cards? There are two cards that synergize particularly well with rolling a d20. Uh, one of them is, uh, you know, Clark's other thumb. Oh, right. You know, because uh, it just even cares though if you roll. Yeah, even though it doesn't synergize with rolling a d20, it has you rolling two dice instead of one, and then you're more likely to get above 10 on your AFR cards, and so you're more likely to trigger your commander. Uh, there is one uh, sneaky card that does synergize with rolling a d20, and that is Steel Squirrel. Okay. It's a two mana, one one artifact creature squirrel. Whenever you roll a five or higher on a die, just so any die, you know, Steel Squirrel gets plus X plus X until end of turn where X is the result. And you can pay six to roll a six sided die. But if you roll so another card says roll a die and it happens to be a D20, you could roll a 20. Like the Earth Cult <laughs> Elemental, then this thing yes. can become 21 power. Yes. And uh, then also it can keep going. Like let's say you have a couple rolls. 
oh, you go roll a d20, roll a d20, this thing has 30 power now? Yeah, and look, it's a two drop. It could just be gigantic. <laughs> that would be awesome. That would be sweet. <laughs> it is interesting it says roll a six-sided die. Oh, so what you were saying earlier is a lot of them say when you roll a six-sided die. Yes, or roll a six-sided die, or when you get a three. So those won't even trigger at all off of d20s because exactly. it's when you roll a six-sided die. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right, so the unthing may or may not work very well. But so, if it doesn't work really well, people are more likely to let you rule zero it. Sure, I think I would let them rule zero anyway, just because, like, hey, <laughs> mechanics only been in two sets ever. <laughs> like, go ahead. Um, so, uh, okay, so if we... Boy, this got quite a bit worse, because that we're talking about, you know, 23 cards in the main set, maybe three or four, we're hoping, in the commander product. Less than 30, probably, cards. And that's not even counting whether they're playable. Like, how many of those are good? Ten? Yeah. Ten. I'm putting a lot of hope in the commander sets, honestly. Like, that's that's where I hope that there'll be more commander effects. Is this any good if you don't have the... If any of those results are ten or higher, draw a card on it. Like, if are you happy with a four mana 3-3 three, three flying and menace? Nope. No, you're not. So I don't even know there's a way to build around that. I mean, you can put, like, the sort ofs and stuff and just be like, it's hard to block. But, yeah, okay. Well, it'll, it'll be fun, though. I think that, listen. Dice rolling is fun. And yeah. so if you're looking for an is it dice rolling commander, and if you uh, if it gives you more leverage to be able to rule zero, some crazy zany cards, then that could make this really fun. But no one's excited about attacking with a flying menacing hill giant. I think, you know, we have a lot of people, and I, I like to point these out when they happen, that, like, play powerful decks and their their playgroup targets them or doesn't like that their decks are just too powerful, build a Faraday deck to as high power as you can uh, without just doing, like, some CEDH shell. I know, it's just blue-red shell with no a fair, rolling Yeah, put, put dice rolling <laughs> cards in there and stuff. Uh, and then I think, like, you can still... As soon as you bring that to the table, you can play it to try to win, but you'll have just come with... Uh, a lower power deck and and you know if you have a lot of high power decks it's a nice to have some of that in your arsenal to just take the edge off um to just play it once in a while and then you know go ahead both of us have different yeah. different power level decks like we both have nines and we both have ones that are like around six like yep. we, we most of our decks are in the same range because we know our play group really well but we still have lower power decks and sometimes it's great to have a commander that lets you play that that power level yeah, I love to have a deck where it's like, I'm going to pill pull this out. This deck is not that great. I'm going to win. As soon as we start the game, I'm going to try and win with it. But it's coming in disadvantage, and I know that, and I'm fine with it, and that's totally cool, and it'll be a challenge this game. And that's cool because now I'm not just playing powerful decks against people that either aren't liking it as much or feeling bad about it, right? I get to mix those in once in a while, you know, or play them against people who are just starting out or whatever to kind of keep things fun. Yeah. Okay. Let's go on to the next one. This is, uh, spoiler alert, my pick for the most powerful commander. It's my, it's my pick, too, for the most yeah, powerful. I'm pretty sure it is. <laughs> like, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be hard to talk. And it's an uncommon. It's Gretchen Titch Willow. Green and a blue, two mana for a 0-4. Legendary Halfling Druid. Pay two, a green and a blue, colon. So as many times as you have two, a green and a blue, four mana, you can do this. You pay that mana, you draw a card, and then you may put a land card from your hand onto the battlefield. Feels like... Does it feel like someone we know, DJ? <laughs> feels a lot like Thrasios, yeah, right? Yeah, it feels a lot like Thrasios. It's kind of like a quote-unquote fair Thrasios. Uh, Thrasios turns out one of the most powerful commanders there is. Um, here's the differences. Thrasios is colorless mana to activate so gretchen you need a green and a blue and two thrasios that, is just four that's a big deal because it's easier to combo with colorless mana than it is to have colored mana yeah it's just a lot easier to make infinite colorless mana than infinite colored mana uh not that you can't do it it just takes out a couple of the combos mm -hmm. um thrasios you scry one and then you reveal the top card of your library and if it's a land you put it in a play tapped and if it's not you draw it this one you just straight up draw a card you don't scry and then you may put a land card from your hand onto the battlefield untapped if it's an untapped land, which is like a minor, it's a minor upside. What do you think is better, the scry or the or the untapped land? Uh, I think the untapped land is probably better. I think it's so. Pretty too. close, but I think it's better. Yeah, I think so too. Honestly, early in the game or in the mid game, like the ability to be like, let's say you have seven lands, do this. If you get a land there, you can activate a second time where mm -hmm. you can't really do that with Thrasios, that kind of thing. And the scry often is. You know, you still don't know what you're getting if you scry it to the bottom. But sometimes you... Often, I will say, when I play my Thrasios deck, most of the time, I want to land on top. 
That's what I want. Yeah. I want to just ramp because that snowballs. Then I can just activate more times. So this kind of allows you to do that. Even if you don't draw a land, you have a land in your hand. Put oh, it down. Because yeah. yeah, it doesn't right. have to be the card you drew either. So I think that's a little bit better. Um, everything that's good with Thrasios is going to be good with Gretchen pretty much, right? What about the the one other difference, uh, partner? Oh, that's a pretty big difference, I'd yeah. say. Although I've seen many decks that are just Thrasios. Like a lot of times you may as well add we'll Timna Hydel, or know. somebody in there, but I've seen quite a few that are just like, eh, whatever, Thrasios is the deck. And those <laughs> decks are can be CEDH, right? Like you don't need any, like Thrasios by itself, CEDH level, but having partner does definitely give you access to other things. I don't think that's a major downside, though. Yeah, but one thing that we're doing is we're comparing it to, you know, a proven powerful commander. Cards that go in that proven powerful commander's deck that are going to be good. Training grounds make the uh, activation just green and a blue. Or Seedborn Muse on top of everything on everybody's turn. Wilderness Reclamation, that's just a lot of activations. Um, I think it will, in some cases, need an additional piece to sort of, quote-unquote, go off. So if you are still putting in uh, infinite mana loops that are colorless, uh, Basalt Monolith, Rings of Bright Hearth, that kind of stuff, you're going to need some way to filter that mana into colored mana. So Gemstone Array or like Chromatic Ori, as as it pains me to admit that anyone would ever play that card. Um, But it does filter your mana. I think probably you just don't play those in the deck. And you just, if you want to make this into combo, you still can. And a lot of the stuff that people use with Thrasios will still work, right? The Palancron, uh, Peregrine Drake with Deadeye Navigator stuff that everybody does. Oh, yeah. What you do with Thrasios generally in the combo side of things, the CEDH side of things, is you create infinite mana, you activate it infinite times, you draw your whole deck, you cast your whole deck, and you win by casting your whole deck. Usually you win by like Thassa's Oracle at the end or Lab Maniac. Yep. And this will still work with all of that, and you just have to create infinite mana in a way that allows you to have colored mana mixed in there. Powerful. Very powerful. Yeah, for sure. Um, Is there anything that... Would you build this deck differently? So, like, if you saw this across from the battlefield from you, would you assume that it is Thrasios level power, or would you be like, oh, well, they're not playing Thrasios, so this must be, like, the fairer version of it or something like that? I don't, I, I don't know. I think I, it would just depend on talking to them before the game. Like, is hey, is it CADH or is it not? Because I think you could build it CADH and it'll be a little worse maybe than Thrasios, but mostly the same. But like, if you're going, CADH decks are not super cheap, so you'd probably just, yeah, just have Thrasios. Already, yeah, if you're already spending that much yeah. money to get all that crazy stuff that you've talked about and make it really tuned to, to bring it up to that high power level, Thrasios isn't that much more than this. So you might just get right. that little tiny bit of extra power level for that. And like, I have a Thrasios and Vile Smasher deck, but there are no infinite mana combos in it. Thrasios is still very good, but it's not going to ever combo out in Thassa's Oracle or Lab Man. doesn't even have those cards in the deck. Mm-hmm. Uh, so people can definitely build Gretchen as like a value engine way to go, and Simic's really good at that. be great, yeah. Yeah. That deck's still going to be really good. It's so really it's not going to be a huge difference as far as like, m- like, is it C8H or is it an 8? You know, it's just like somewhere yeah. in there probably. Well, I think a lot of people that are looking for really powerful decks uh, and are just starting out, they could go with this because it's it's an uncommon. It's you know what I mean? Strong, yeah. It's strong. It's an uncommon. It's in powerful colors. And so I think that this could be a good um, starting point into making powerful decks. But the problem is if you do that, people may assume it's stronger than it is. Mm-hmm. In which case, maybe you don't want to use that as your commander. I don't know. That's one of the complicated things about, uh, about commander in general. Okay. Well, without going into that, let's talk about the next commander which is a, a venture into the dungeon that's commander. right the next commander is hamapashar ruin seeker one white blue for a two three legendary human wizard room abilities of dungeons you own trigger an additional time Whew. so that means that when you go into a room you know you don't go into two rooms you just go into that room and you get the effect and then you get the effect again yeah, the first time I read it, I thought you ventured twice, basically moved two steps in the dungeon. Mm-hmm. But yeah, you're yeah, right. You just move the same amount of steps, but you just get whatever you would get twice. So in the first room in uh, Dungeon of the Mad Mage, instead of gaining one life, you gain two life. In Dungeon level one, instead of scrying one, you would scry one, then scry one again. Uh, you wouldn't scry two, though. It's different. Yeah. Um, yeah, <laughs> so Humbabashar, obviously a venture into the dungeon commander, commander, and in a different tact than Barwin, which is that... It does want you to venture often rather than get through and complete a dungeon. Yeah, and have you probably going through the dungeons that have the biggest payoffs so you double those big payoffs. Like the dungeon that has a downside, do you really want to like double up Oubliette? No. No. So you're never going into the Tomb of Annihilation, <laughs> probably. It has a safer side, but still. Yeah. Yeah, you're probably doing Dungeon of the Mad Mage or Lost Mine of Fandelver, which is like 
depending on which way you go, each room has like an upside. So how many dungeon matters, du- venture into the dungeon or dungeon payoff cards exist in blue white in the set? So there are 18 blue and white dungeon payoffs so far. Uh, one thing to note is that there is an Esper uh, commander in the commander precon, which we don't know what's inside of it, uh, but it includes blue and white and, and dungeons is a thing. It's on the name of it. It's dungeons of death. That's yeah. the, that's the face of it. Yeah. And it, it says venture into the dungeon on that commander. So we can assume just like the dice rolling that there will be some amount of new cards probably that have venture into the dungeon in some way on them. So maybe our number is an 18. It's more like 23 Same thing with die rolling. You know, yeah. we're, just, we're just really hoping that that has a couple more. Well, I would say the die rolling deck is gruel. That's and right. The one we talked about was is it. So there's way less crossover. Whereas this one's Esper. Yeah, one color versus yeah. I got and this one's Esper. And so, but you're right. There could be a black venture into the dungeon card that exists that wouldn't be able to go in the Hamish. Yeah, chart. or black white like the like this guy. Yeah. yeah. So it's only the blue and white ones. But anyway, there's maybe enough to make Hamish Pashar. I'll say one thing. Hamish Pashar almost certainly goes into the commander, whatever the face commander is on that dungeon precon deck. Oh yeah, for sure. So, but let's talk about Ham Pashar as as if they're the commander. So I'll tell you what, in off-camera testing for some future content, uh, I was able to go off with Hama Pashar. Uh, being able to double up dungeons is huge, and I was able to double up uh, the last mode of Dungeon of the Mad Mage uh, and be able to draw three, play something for free, then draw three again and play something else for free. Like, that is a huge effect. Uh, and so doubling up is is crazy good and i'm really excited about about this card yeah i mean it's not surprising right anytime we have a thing that says hey whatever your main theme is do that twice the pain harmonicons the taste of death harmonicon triggers like doubling season this is a thing they do in in magic all the time and it seems like of course anytime our theme is around the thing do two of that thing it's good. And they just did uh, Arya Nev or whatever, mm-hmm. which is like basically that on a commander. So yeah. here we are with that on a commander. The question is like, that's a token strategy and tokens have been around in Magic for 15, 20 years and they're in every set, more or less. Whereas Venture into the Dungeon is one time. And it's so, not coming in, the, like the next set coming up is not going to have Venture into a Dungeon. Right. Yeah. So are there enough <laughs> enablers to make Ham Pashar really, really good as a commander? I think that's going to remain to be seen. Yeah. Um, it feels like Dungeon of the Mad Mage, just looking at it, is the best one for Hama Pashar just because it has a lot of value along the way and that really big finish uh, or when you complete it. Yeah, doubling up a legendary demon? No. <laughs> yeah, that, that wouldn't be good. Um, so, yeah, I think it really depends on the venture cards. I, I, we've got a note here that most venture into dungeon cards we've seen in AFR in these colors are on creatures. Mm-hmm. So you're going to be probably a creature-based deck. You're going to want protection for creatures. You're going to want to blink your creatures, maybe, just because a lot of them have ETBs. Yeah, so we got we got the one that we already mentioned that says, when it enters the battlefield, venture into a dungeon. And so if you were to be able to blink it, you know, you can venture into the dungeon again, and you might have several creatures that do that. And so you could venture deeper and deeper. Yeah. It feels like a blink deck is an already established strategy that's pretty strong. And this is going to be like <laughs> using a lot of those same cards to venture which is inherently going to just be weaker if only because there's just less of it also early steps in venturing the dungeon are just not like they're not wouldn't you rather just blink your mole drifter than like gain one life twice and scry once twice yes that is true but i think that again (laughs) along the same lines as uh what was the name faraday that could be good if you build the hama pashar deck to the the most optimal that the hama pashar deck can be then that's still probably out at like a five and a half, six level, and you can kind of constrain the power level of your deck if that's something you want to do. Yeah. How many times have you blinked a mold drifter in your life? Or oh that's... man, but it's never like I, I hope I do it again <laughs> tonight. Like, like I just wanted. Enough, but... Yeah, I can never get you know, enough. But, but there's a but unique, yes, a million there's a times. Unique, there's a yeah. uniqueness uh, and something like that's interesting about venturing to dungeons, and something like exciting about that and right. rolling dice. How many dungeons have I ever completed? Zero so far because I did not test out this deck. So. Uh, it's fun. Yeah. I think it's really fun to go through the dungeon and, and roll dice. And so even though the power level is, I think we're looking at evaluating it, we're accepting it is a little bit lower. But you that know. might be good. That yeah. might be on and purpose, I think, yeah. But then it, don't detract from the fun. Because yeah. even though the power is lower, sometimes people say winning is the only thing that's fun. You know what I mean? And so they're like, we need higher power level because that's the way I have fun. Right. But like going through dungeons is fun. And even though that might not win you every game as reliably as another strategy, like have fun at your commander games. This is really cool. 
All right, let's move on to the next one, which is Kalane, Reclusive Painter. I will say that Kalane is one of the commanders being played in the next game nights. Ooh. We haven't uh, announced who the guests are yet, so I'll keep that secret for now. But Kalane's definitely making an appearance. Kalane is a black and a red, two mana for a one, two. Legendary human elf bard. Is that a half elf in D&D lore? Yes, I'm sure it is. Sure. When Kalane <laughs> enters the battlefield, create a treasure token. So two mana, one, two, gets a treasure. But then says, other creatures you control enter the battlefield with an additional plus one, plus one counter on them for each mana from a treasure spent to cast them. So if Kalane's out and you use four treasure to cast a four mana, four, four, it would actually come in as an eight, eight. It would get four plus one, plus one counters because you use four treasure to cast it. So every treasure gets a plus one, plus one counter. This is pretty interesting. Treasure tribal plus plus one, plus one counter synergy in Rakdos. Okay. Um, again, it feels like um, plus one, plus one counters are aggressive. You know, ramping into bigger things, you know, is also aggressive. So it is playing into the Rakdos aggressive thing. Uh, but I think that this is going to highlight how good we've all said treasure is. You know, we were talking about this the other day. When is the last game you played in where a treasure was not created? It was probably like 2016 or something, right? Like, <laughs> it's been a long time. Treasures are the most ubiquitous, I think, token in the game for good reason. Like, they're very useful. Uh, everybody wants to create it and use it for extra mana, and there's so many other ways to utilize them as well. Yeah, now that you mention it, I, I'm pretty sure that I have, like, some treasury thing uh, in a lot of my decks. Um, yeah, that's really interesting. Okay, so let's talk about the, what I uh, wrote down as the... It's really a three-step plan oh, okay. of what the Kalane deck probably is. I got some help from the guest uh, that created the deck for this episode. Ooh, straight from the guest. Let's yeah. do it. Uh, all right. So step one, he didn't tell me the steps. I just came up with those myself. <laughs> but some of the cards that he put in his deck, I, I used for inspiration here. Step one, create a bunch of treasure, right? So you've got like Impulsive Pilfer, uh, Magda, which Jimmy played on a past episode of Game Nights. There's things like uh, the new Ragavan creates mm. treasure tokens. Good one. Uh, Doxai Extortionist, do we even need to mention it? But it's like early in the game, you want to create a bunch of treasure so that later in the game, you can use those treasure, this is step number two, to cast creatures. And I think preferably you want creatures with haste, right? Because if you're going to cast something and it's really big, you want it to swing right now. Mm hmm when you're investing your treasures into it it's yeah. not just mana like that's a that's a limited resource you have to you know use them up and you know if you use up all of your treasures and invest in a creature that's like a 10 10 or something like that because you've gone all in you don't want to have it killed and then have to reset your treasure you know arsenal i think also they balance haste by like usually making the creature a little bit smaller mm -hmm. and so you can kind of counterbalance that by being like well i use all treasure and so this thing is actually hitting for 10 out of nowhere nice uh, so, like, Captain Lannery Storm's a great one because she also creates treasure tokens. The Riot mechanic, I think, could be good because it either puts a plus one, plus one counter on something or it gets haste. So if Kalane's not doing its thing, you can still have your plus one, plus one counter synergies going on. Um, so, like, Skargan Hellkite is, like, a 4-4 four, four that... If, it, if you spent five treasures on it, would be a 9-9 nine, nine haste flyer coming in. It's great. And it has an activated ability yeah. that, that so deals like, damage to stuff. Yeah, but based on the number of plus one, based on the plus one, plus one counters. So like, it's kind of interesting because sometimes you're like, well, I want to attack now, but I want this activated ability to be online. But now you get to have both. Right. That's Cast awesome. it with the treasures, use my lands to activate it. That seems pretty cool. Also, it swings for nine. Um, then there's like Exava. Rakdos Blood Witch, which is two black red for a 3 3 first strike haste, has Unleash, which means you can either have it come in with a 1 1 counter, and if you do, uh, uh, it can't block. But it also says each other creature you control with a plus one, plus one counter on it has haste. So you, if you get Exava out early, use that as the haste grounder for everything you cast with treasures because that will come in with, that has a plus one, plus one counter because of the Kalane thing, yeah. And then treasure synergy. Also, I okay. think you're balancing treasure synergy with plus one, plus one counter synergy. So there's like Mayhem Devil. Anytime you'd sack a permanent, it deals one damage to any target. Goldspan Dragon, treasures tap, or treasures um, go for two now. It doesn't work super great, though, because it, Kalin cares about the number of treasures. Oh, that's so funny. You, you <laughs> sacrificed. But it, you could do things like, okay, I'm going to sacrifice 
uh, four treasures, that creates eight mana. I'm going to use one mana from each of them for this four drop and one mana from each of them for okay, this so four drop. Okay, so still good. Still right? Is that how that would work with Kalein? Uh, other creatures you control enter the battlefield with an additional one one counter on them for each mana from a treasure spent to cast them. Yeah. Yeah, that works. So you would have to get finicky with the math, but gold span still seems good. Uh, jury, Master of the Review. Is a, and there's a few cards that have similar wording. It's red and a black for a 1-1. One, one. Whenever you sacrifice a permanent, put a 1-1 one, one counter on Jury. And then when Jury dies, it, it deals damage equal to its power to any target. Nice. So, so getting that loaded up with plus one plus one counters does does a lot. Yeah, it comes in as a 3-3 three, three maybe with treasures. And then as you sack treasures along the way, it gets bigger and bigger. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then the plus one plus one counter synergy, Ozolith, um, Skyclave Shadowcat is a cool one. Uh, three and a black for a 3-3, three, three. you can pay one in black, sack another creature, put a 1-1 one, one counter on it, or whenever a creature you control with a 1-1 one, one counter on it dies, draw a card. That's like every creature you have. Yeah, because you're going to cast at least one treasure on everything, hopefully. And then, because, you know, plus one, plus one counters, that's mostly known to be in, like, green, white, or green, black, right? Green is almost always in the mix, yeah. so Rakdos plus one, plus one counters doesn't have a ton of support, but proliferate's really, really good. Oh, with yeah, plus one, right. plus one counters. So like Yawgmoth, Thrawn's a Physician. It's easy to forget, but it has pro Proliferate on there. It does so many other it's things. It's just such a good card. Yeah. But yeah, the Proliferate can grow your team for sure. And simultaneously be killing their creatures because it puts negative one counters on stuff. So I think the Kalein deck is actually pr quite good and, and quite strong. That's great. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the Rakdos Precon, the face commander that we, we have seen, even though we don't know what's in the deck yet, uh, does interact with treasures. Uh, yeah, it's sacrifice. What, what Prosper. Um, oh, right. It creates treasure every time you cast, cast something, something out of exile. from exile, and yeah. then it lets you cast things from exile. Oh, interesting. So maybe that even yeah. goes in there, or Kalen goes in that deck. Yeah, very, very cool. Yeah, there's and there's other treasure synergies in the set, too. And treasures, unlike, and dragons, right? unlike Venture... Oh, yeah, that's true, actually. Yeah. yeah. But unlike Venture into the Dungeon and Dice Rolling, treasures are in every set. Mm -hmm. So this is a deck that has a ton of support and will just continue to get more support as you know every set comes yeah, out. We just pulled like 10 cards that are amazing that deal and interact with treasures. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I haven't seen any of the new Innistrad stuff, uh, but I'll guarantee there's some cards in there that make treasure because every set has some stuff that does oh, that yeah. now. Okay. We've got a bunch more multicolored commanders to go, but uh, before we continue, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Hi there. I'm Veraska, and this is my boyfriend, Jace. Hello. Since we started dating, a lot has happened. We fought an evil god, Jace's ex betrayed us. I lost my job to a dragon. We've had stuff to work through, and it wasn't always easy maintaining effective communication. I mean, I'm no mind reader. No, oh, I am a mind reader, but it's still hard. That's why we turned to BetterHelp for couples counseling. BetterHelp found us a licensed professional therapist who specialized in relationships and could meet us over the internet on a schedule that worked for our lifestyle. And it isn't just for relationships. If there's something getting in the way of your happiness, BetterHelp is there for you. They they have counselors that specialize in grief, anxiety, stress, anger, whatever you need. Well, they've certainly helped me get better at expressing my emotions. Which I'm a big fan of. We want you to start living a happier life today. As a Command Zone listener, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting our sponsor at betterhelp.com slash command zone. Join over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health. Again, that's betterhelp, hel pcom slash command zone. Now our relationship is as solid as a rock. And if it goes downhill, I can always turn him into a rock. <laughs> She's kidding. Am I? Previously on Bruise and Silas, Vice Cops. You've got to testify against the Orzhov. I owe the Orzhov too much money. If I speak out, I'll be in debt to the deathless forever. You just need Upstart, the fast and easy way to pay off your debt with a personal loan and all online. Now the thrilling conclusion. Your case is dead in the water, Bruce and Silas. The Syndicate has his whole city under its ghostly thumb. Not anymore. I, Eternal Witness, will testify against you, Syndicate scum. Thanks to Upstart, I was able to get out from under your predatory loans. Unlike you, Upstart looked at more than just my credit score, like my income and employment status. That let them offer me a smarter interest rate so I could trust they aren't trying to destroy me like you. It only took five minutes to do an online rate check and I was able to receive my payment the very next business day. What? No! Curse you, Upstart! Find out how Upstart can lower your monthly payments today when you go to upstart.com slash command. That's upstart.com slash command. Don't forget to use our URL to let them know we sent you. Loan amounts will be determined based on your credit, income, and certain other information provided in your loan application. Go to upstart.com slash command today. The entire Orzhov Syndicate is going away for a long time. Is that how this works? Oh, I don't know. I'm not a lawyer. All right, and then I'll pass the turn. Okay, on your end step, I'm going to crack my Bloodstained Mire. Jake, I've been thinking, why is it that we crack fetch lands at the end of turn? 
It's a small optimization, it costs nothing, and it can help you make better decisions. Precisely. We consider little advantages like that all the time when we're playing Magic. I think we should apply that thinking to our nutrition too. How do we do that exactly? Well, for example, I've started using Ritual. It's a twice a day multivitamin that helps fill in the gaps in my nutrition. I don't always have time to watch my diet as closely as I should, but Ritual makes it easy for me to get high quality nutrients like vitamin D3 into my body every single day. Plus, they taste great and have options designed for men, women, teens, whatever you need, they've got. Ritual just makes healthy habits easier. They deliver your multivitamins right to your door every month and shipping is free. They'll even refund you after your first month if you aren't satisfied, so there's really no risk. It's an all upside play, just like the fetch land thing. Okay, my ritual. That's the spirit. No, I mean a dark ritual. I'm about to combo off. Oh, that's less good. Get key nutrients without the hassle. Ritual is offering fans of the Command Zone 10% off during your first three months. Visit ritual.com slash command to start your ritual today. Again, that's ritual.com slash command. All right, we're back. We're talking about the multicolored new legendary creatures from Adventures in Forgotten Realms. The main set, not the commander products, because we don't know those cards yet. Um, and we're moving on. Who are we on now? We're on Crydell of Baldur's Gate. It's blue-black for a 1-3 legendary creature, Human Elf Rogue. Whenever Crydell of Baldur's Gate uh, deals combat damage to a player, that player loses one life and mills a card. Then you gain one life and scry one. Okay. Whenever you attack, you may pay two. If you do, target creature can't be blocked this turn. Okay, so... By the way, it says whenever you attack, not just so you attack with this creature. Yeah, That's well, interesting. That is interesting. Usually it says whenever you attack with one or more creatures or something like that. They're probably just trying to shorten it because there's a lot of words on cards now. Yeah, you're right. But like, it, you don't have to send this into combat and then activate. You can just like, whenever you attack, pay two. With, with anybody, right? Yeah. It does not with this card. Yeah. But it's also only once. It's exactly. Not, yeah, it's one. You can make one thing unblockable. It's one thing unblockable, yeah. Cradle uh, is interesting. It uh, doesn't matter how much it hits for you'll still only mill them for the one, they'll lose one life, and you gain one life and scry one. Like, you can put, you know, you can make it a 10, 13, or whatever, a 10, 12, and it'll still just do the one. <laughs> yeah. that I mean, that effect is not super exciting. I think that we are excited about Unblockable, right? Yeah, so Unblockable is kind of the main part about it, and I put down some cards just in good faith here because, you know, we like to talk about what you might be able to do with it. So, like, Phage the Untouchable, if he deals combat damage to a player, <laughs> that player loses the game. I mean, that's pretty fun. I like that. Yeah, Quietus <laughs> Spike, you know, is an equipment, gives a creature death touch, but when it deals dam combat damage to damage to a player that player loses half of their life that's round not the it up. only and that's not the only black card that does that a yeah. lot of them will cut your life total in half Virtus and things like that'll yeah. do it uh so yeah you can make things unblockable infect you know make an infect creature i'm sure that's how craig would use this make it unblockable crafted exoskeleton and whatnot uh get in there ninjas ninjas like to be unblocked oh uh, yeah ninjas like to be unblocked too maybe this goes in the eureka deck i don't know um here's the thing though unblockable is not hard to come by if you're in blue Right? Like, there are tons of cards that make all your creatures unblockable. We just saw Sun Quan from <laughs> uh, Post Malone do that. Archetype of Imagination, Imagination basically does that. Gives your stuff flying and takes flying away from everything else. So I just, uh, I don't know. I'm not excited about this There card. are equipment that are a little bit harder to interact with that don't have you, you know, you can pay one time to equip your creature and get right. it unblockable. And there's lots of other forms of evasion. Like you mentioned blue, like there's ways to just give your team flying or, or you know, there's a lot of different ways. Horsemanship. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know. Do you, do you see anything interesting about this card? To me, it's just like, meh. I, I think that there are people out there playing Cassetto uh, that are not playing Snakes that are kind of doing that unblockable thing. And so I think that... still better because you can do multiple creatures, right? That's true. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I'm not I'm not into... I think it's about... Crydle. I don't think we'll ever see a commander deck uh, helmed by Crydle. And then some... I know somebody out there is like, I'm going to build it just so I can play against you, Josh, at a GP and prove I you wrong. I think someone's going to fade you. <laughs> someone's going to fade you with it. Do you think you'll ever see a Crydle deck... At like, for real? Now that you're saying this, maybe, but before, no. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> it's like that scientific truism about any time you study a thing, you alter the thing. Yeah, for yeah. sure. I can never make that statement because it makes it happen. All right, let's talk about the next uh, commander on the list, which is the commander that Jimmy will be playing in the next episode of Game Nights. It's Minsk, Beloved Ranger. Cost just Naya, so red, green, blue. Uh, sorry, red, green, white, three mana. For a 3-3 three, three, legendary human ranger, when Minsk enters the battlefield, create Boo, a legendary 1-1 one, one red hamster creature token with trample and haste. Then you can pay X, 
Until end of turn, target creature you control has power and toughness XX and becomes a giant in addition to its other types. But, big text here, activate only as a sorcery. Ooh, okay. So you pay X and you kind of mirror entity one thing. It changes it to a giant, not all creature types. But you can only do that at sorcery speed. Uh, Talk to Jimmy here just to get his thoughts on how he built the deck. First off, people are going to be excited because this is like a main character. Yeah, main character. Boo is very famous, yes. And seeing Boo like trample around and crush people (laughs) is going to be cool. Yeah, for sure. Uh, So Jimmy, I talked to Jimmy a little bit about his deck. Uh, First of all, it's, it's worth noting that it's an insta KO on somebody if you ever get infinite mana or just a real lot of mana, right? Because Boo has Trample mm-hmm. and Haste. So literally you can just cast Minsk, make Boo, make it however big it needs to be, and then attack them with it. Boo does not do uh, commander damage, though. Only Minsk does. That's some. That's something to note. Minsk can target itself. It just says, until I'm turn, target creature you control. Okay. But Minsk doesn't have Haste. So anyway, whatever. You create a lot of mana, it will knock somebody out unless they have a removal spell, of course. That's not what Jimmy did. Jimmy went sort of a giant changeling tribal deck. Ooh. Yeah, which is interesting. His full deck list obviously will be released when the episode releases, so I don't want to go into it too much. But he used he he went sort of towards like Calamity Bearer, which is two red red for a three four. If a giant source you control would deal damage to a permanent or player, it deals double that damage that permanent or player said. Nice. Makes Boo pretty threatening. Also, anything mints targets and changes the power and toughness of becomes a giant. So he can sort of, even for one mana, although it would make it into a 1-1, one, one, turn something into a giant if he wanted to. Uh, he also had, what's the next card? Like, Sertlin Flinger in there. Three red red for a 4-6. You want to read it? No, I just don't know what it is. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It's a, it's five mana, 4-6 giant. When it attacks, you may sacrifice another creature. When you do, it deals, Sertlin Flinger deals damage equal to the sacrifice creature's power to any target. But if the sacrifice creature was a giant... Certainly, Flinger deals twice that much damage instead. So you pump like nine mana into Boo, swing, hit them for nine, and then certainly Flinger. Oh, you wouldn't even hit them. It it's when it attacks. attacks. So, but you hit him for it 18. Gives, yeah, yeah. But it gives them another another level of doing. You don't have to get combat damage through. You can just, just immediately fling, and it flings for a lot. Yeah. So that's pretty cool. Jimmy talked about um, giving all his creatures, all creature types, to sort of make them all into giants and playing some a bunch of changelings. So he played Blades of Ve- Ve- Velis Veil. And Mirror Entity. Well, Mirror as, Entity is like the card, right? Yeah. Because it's like... It's like, kind do of, this for all your stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So, he also considered uh, building around plus one, plus one counters, because plus one, plus one counters work well with Miss Ability, because mm-hmm. you change it, its base power and toughness into a 6-6, six, six, but whatever counters it had, also add on top of that. So, if it was a 4-4 four, four with three plus one, plus one counters, it becomes a 9-9 nine, nine or whatever. Um, Infect, I think, could also be a thing with Boo, obviously, because it has Trample, has Haste, Infect it up. Yeah. Get in there. Make Craig happy. <laughs> uh, I was looking at this card, and I th- was thinking I might look for creatures that care about what their power and toughness is. Ooh, interesting. So there's like Cultivator of Blades, Wild, Beastmaster, and Pathbreaker Ibex, and they all say when they attack, creatures you control get a power boost based on what their power is. So I'll just read Pathbreaker Ibex. This one also gives Trample. The other two don't. Whenever it attacks, creatures you control gain trample and plus X plus X until end of turn where X is the greatest power among creatures you control. So if you have a few creatures, you get Pathbreaker out, you dump all your man into it, say, oh, well, this is a base power and toughness 9-9 nine, nine now. All your creatures get plus 9, plus 9 and trample. So this is a way to make mints kind of de facto grow all of your board. Uh, which I think is interesting. And then you're going to want like a big board. So there are token creators that care about like your biggest creature. So Elemental Mastery is kind of cool. It's an enchantment aura, and it gives uh, you enchant a creature, and then you can tap that creature and put X one one red elemental creature tokens with haste into play, where X is that creature's power. Remove them from the game at end of turn. Oh, that's cool because you, they might have an answer for one, but then you're like, tap There's it, a lot of make a lot now. of them. Yeah, it doesn't actually make squirrels, but I would pretend that they were because, or sorry, hamsters because that would be cool. <laughs> you get all the booze and just yeah. copies all the booze. <laughs> They're like. Technically, you made elementals. Shut up, you're dying to hamsters. Yeah, we're crossing out the Sorry. legendary and just going on with <laughs> more hamsters. Um, Ooze Garden's interesting. It's one in a green for an enchantment. You pay one in a green, sacrifice a non-ooze creature, and then put an XX green ooze creature token into play where X is a sacrifice creature's po- power. You can only do this as a sorcery. So you can make something big, attack with it, and then sack it and keep up that big creature around. Uh, fungal Sprouting makes saprolings equal to the... Uh, power of the greatest creature you control, the biggest creature you control. Um, and then there are a bunch of creatures that kind of care about how big your other creatures are when they attack. 
So Tuya Bear Claw, when it attacks, it gets plus X plus X, where X is the greatest power among other creatures you control. Rubble Belt Riders, Impetuous Protege. There might, I think there's a deck there that kind of says, I'm going to get the board set up, and then I'm going to dump you know nine or ten mana into one creature, and all my creatures get that big, and then kill people that way. That's cool. There's, I think that what's great about this is that there's a lot of really interesting cards, because like a lot of the time, you know, we're giving you set reviews, and we're talking about Creator cards. Hoof. You know, there's cards that Prime we for the about. hordes. Yeah. But like you mentioned- Beastmaster Ascension. Yeah, a bunch yeah. of cards out there, and I'm like, oh, that one? Yeah, I won't. I've only oh, seen that in limited before. Yeah, I know, right? yeah. so I've, I always think that's cool when it sort of opens the door to cards that you wouldn't otherwise play. I, again, I don't think this deck is going to be incredibly powerful or anything, but I think it can be fun and cool. Definitely. All, All right. right, next one. Next up, we have Orcus, Prince of Undeath. Kind of looks like Rakdos is like, I don't know. It's like the... Cousin? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Cousin from the other side of the tracks. Yeah, that's what it looks sure. like, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's X... Two black red for a 5-3 legendary creature demon. It has flying and trample. And with Orcus Prince of Undeath enters the battlefield, choose one. Each other creature gets minus X minus X until end of turn. You lose X life. Or return up to X target creature cards with total mana value X or less from your graveyard to the battlefield. They gain haste until end of turn. Okay, so it's... It's two red, black, and X. So at its base, it's a four mana, five, three flying, flample, flying trample. Yeah. That does nothing else. That does nothing else. But if you pump X, let's say X is equal to three, that's seven mana, then you kind of could give the whole board negative three, negative three, and, and you, you lose, lose three, three life. Okay. Uh, or you can choose what? Return up it's to- It's mana value, so you could just get a three drop back. Return up to X target creature cards with total mana value. So you could get a three drop or a two drop and a one drop. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. So it's very powerful. Yeah. But it takes a ton of mana. Because if if X was equal to 50... Oh, yeah. You win Then the you game. get all the... Well, you get all the creature cards from your graveyard back onto play. And they gain haste. Oh, they gain haste. Yes. Oh, boy. Okay. So, well, pretty easy strategy on this thing, actually. And I think that's that's pretty cool. Um, yeah. So but very you need expensive. a ton of mana. Yeah, you need a ton of mana to make this really, really work. Absolutely. So you're probably trying to, like, self-mill. Like, oh, sack yeah. your own stuff. You want creatures in the graveyard for sure. Yeah. You're trying to probably wrath the board quite a bit, and you're setting up for like a big mana turn where you just reanimate your whole graveyard. And the great thing is that you have a board wipe in your command zone too. Mm -hmm. So Orcus can always double for like, oh crap, I better just kill everything now. And I don't care because I'm going to get it all back later. Um, so some self-mill cards. Because red doesn't help you much in self-mill. It's usually... You could do some discard stuff. Yeah. But, um, you know, mill gets a lot more cards into your graveyard. But than blue like, and black are the ones that mill, and yeah. red's not great at it. But Ms. Mirak Orb is a good self-mill card. Whenever a permanent becomes untapped, that permanent controller mills a card. It'll mill your opponents too, but whatever. Perpetual timepiece, you tap it, you mill two cards. Altar of Dementia seems good because... You want to mill yourself, but you also want your creatures in the graveyard because you're going to bring them back later. Mm -hmm. um, well, and if they're going to die anyways. Like, yeah. You're like, oh, I have a few creatures that are going to die. You know, I'll sacrifice them anyways. and Mill myself for 10. Yeah. That's more fodder later for uh, Orcus to bring back. Rummaging, like you said, is looting. Or sorry, is looting. Rummaging is not looting. Rummaging is milling, kind of. It's a way to get something in your graveyard, yeah. Yeah, Faithless Looting, Thrill of Possibility, Cathartic Reunion. I like these cards in general because they give you high velocity through your back deck. For help sure. you out when you aren't hitting land drops or when you flood out. Um, so just having extra value. Black has all those um, tutor to your graveyard stuff, buried alive in tomb, allow you to find specific cards, put them into your graveyard. That could be really good. And then red black actually does have quite a decent amount of ways to create a lot of mana explosively so that you could really do the Orcus thing where you regrow everything out of your graveyard and give it haste uh, on an earlier turn than you might think. Because that sounds like, okay, I need 50 mana. That's going to be turn like 12 or 13. But if you have like black market out for most of the game, that might help you. That's whenever a creature dies, you put a counter on it, and then at the beginning of your pre-combat main phase, you add a black for each counter on black market. So if you're killing things over and over throughout the game, you might be getting 10, 12 mana out of this thing at some point. I've seen that happen. Yeah, for sure. And you're mentioning a deck that automatically wants some board wipes that has a board wipe in the command zone, so that seems to work pretty nicely. And then Mana Geyser is the big one I thought of because often that's just uh, you get a red mana for every tapped land your opponent's control. You can get a ton. Often you get 25 plus, and so... I think that's generally going to be enough. Mana Geyser, play Orcus, X is equal to like 22, 23. Oh, yeah. That's often going to be enough. For sure. Uh, Urborg and Cabal Coffers can help you get there too. That's often creating you like an extra 10, 12 mana. You can double in cube and things like that to make that higher. Um, you probably win with like Grey Merchant of Asphodel type deal. 
then you don't even have to attack, right? You just bring back. <laughs> I know, right? 20 things, you know, 10 things, whatever it is. My devotion to black is 18. That usually will ice the game, you know, if it's been going on for a while. And then black just has a lot of redundancy for what Orcus is already doing. Um, Balthor the Defiled will get all your red and black cards out of the graveyards. Living Death will do that too. Now it does, some of this stuff does it for your opponents too, but they're probably not self-milling. And Yeah, like you're, you're milling yourself, you're pitching things to the graveyard, you're going to get the main advantage out of it for sure. Yeah, I think this deck can be powerful because it's going to try to elongate the game a little, just kill stuff over and over until it gets to the point where it's like, okay, my win condition is in my command zone once my graveyard's big enough and have enough mana. And I think the key is to make sure to wait on this commander until you have a lot of mana because on face value, just like paying, like you mentioned, putting four into it or three into it, you know? Yeah. Like a seven, a seven drop that gets a one and a two like that's not and it's gonna, gonna hurt you later when you have to recast it for the third time now you need six extra yeah mana when you to go want off. it to be big you know it's it's eating into that value so i think that it is kind of that controlling self-milling strategy and then when you have the sort of the combo together this helps finish everything off all right let's talk to the next one which is shesra death's whisper two a black and a green four mana for a one three legendary human elf warlock Half elf warlock has oh this is that thing we we're talking about flavor has sort of two abilities one is bewitching whispers when Shesra that's that's uh, it's tougher to say than it looks like it would be <laughs> when Shesra enters gotta, the battle gotta whisper it yeah Shesra. oh when Shesra oh yeah she's death's whisper yeah when Shesra mm -hmm. enters the battlefield target creature blocks this turn of Abel oh interesting and then it has whispers of the grave. At the beginning of your end step, if a creature died this turn, you may pay two life. If you do, draw a card. So four mana, one three, forces something to block. And then if uh, at your end step, if a creature died this turn, presumably the thing you forced to block, yep. then you can pay two life and draw a card. It's an uncommon, by the way. So being able to have a commander in your command zone that you always have access to that gives you card draw is just automatically pretty good yep. you know uh you but want this card is conditional draw this. card draw it is very conditional card draw and it's it's not a lot of card draw because it can only trigger at your own end step Whoa. it's not like every single turn oh yeah 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 um, but you know, you can pair it with other cards that do let you draw cards all the time. So like dark prophecy, whenever a creature you control dies, draw a card and lose a life. Uh, this actually feels a little bit like death reap ritual. Oh, it's interesting because Shesra, uh, doesn't care if it's your opponent's creature that died. So when I said, presumably the one you forced to block, that's actually maybe not true. You could sack your own stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's yeah. probably more likely what you're doing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I got death it. reap ritual is uh, two, a black and a green and has morbid at the beginning of each end step. If a creature died this turn, you may draw a card. Oh, that's nice. You know, each end step, so you draw four. Exactly. Yep. Uh, and so I, we see that card get played a lot. Yeah, we see this card get played a lot. Um, you know, Moldervine Reclamation or Species Specialist or Liliana Dreadhorde in general. Anything. You know, whenever a creature you control, you know, or whenever Every a creature, creature you control, control dies, dies, draw a card. card. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so you'll pair a lot of these different things with this commander. So you might actually have your synergy of getting rid of your creatures or forcing things to block or whatever. And so you won't just draw one card at the end of your turn with this one, you'll draw three cards. Or, right. You know, you, you actually will do something on your opponent's turn. And even though your commander won't trigger, you'll have a lot of other stuff trigger too. So it's aristocracy. It's, it's, yeah. Right. It's probably going to do like sacking its own stuff for value and recurring it, but it's at least it's not an Orzhov. It's in Golgari or sorry, Witherbloom. Absolutely. Um, but also there's this sort of forcing things to block, which can be really interesting. Like what's the best thing to force to block? Like probably something with death touch, you know, you have your commander out there, you know, I play uh, my commander and I attack with something with death touch and you're just like, Oh, okay. I guess I'm just you force their to trade. best thing to block your death touching creature. Exactly. Interesting. Yeah. And we've seen more and more death touch tribal death touch matters stuff in recent years. So there's a lot, a lot of that these days. Yeah. Hooded blight fang is one. I actually think that poison tip archer is one oh, that it's works really well. Aristocrats too. Yes. Because it's aristocrats and death touchy. It's two black green for a two, three elf archer. It has reach and death touch. And whenever another creature dies, each opponent loses one life. Yeah. So then you have the creatures dying, the drawing cards, the losing life, all that good stuff. Um, you know, Veroth, um, Blood Sky Sire, yep. you know. Um, I also think that if you are having a lot of creatures that have Death Touch, you could put uh, Finn, the Fangbearer, in your deck. 
Yep. You know? It makes Death Touchers deal poison counters or whatever. Yeah. 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 Some good stuff, too. Um, and then, of course, you don't have to actually go out of your way to, you know, kill your opponent's creatures. You can just kind of lure them away to allow other creatures to have lines of attack. Oh, you know? okay. Like we mentioned, uh, Virtuous the Veiled and other things that cut your opponent's life total in half. You know, you could say, okay, uh, block this random thing I don't care about. And then it opens up other lines of attack. Um, and then... You know, this also feels a little bit like a Shervel uh, Bane of Monsters deck a little bit. Shervel also has Death Touch, uh, and you can put bounty counters on things to be able to draw cards off of that. Oh, right. You know? So you bounty the thing, you make it block, you attack with whatever, and then it dies, and Shevel collects the bounty. Exactly, and then at the end of the turn... Bane of Monsters. Yeah, and then something died, so you draw another card. Okay. Um, but, you know, death touchy stuff, drawing stuff, cards, aristocrats. There's a lot of overlap there. I actually think that the the card that I really want people to block, Phyrexian Obliterator. You want it to block with, you mean? I well, I wanted to you go know, black, 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 oh, black. Yeah. <laughs> so Phyrexian Obliterator is black, 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 four black pips for a 5-5 five, five, uh, trampling... Uh, horror whenever a source deals damage to Frexian obliterator that source's controller sacrifices that many permits oh right so you just choose like I, you don't care you have some huge thing, you have on yeah. your side of the battlefield and you're like okay yeah i'm gonna play my commander i'm and gonna force your super big drizzit to block my Frexian obliterator and you have to sack six permanents yeah Ooh, that's brutal <laughs> oh that's pretty cool okay I like that tech right there. I like the uh, Phyrexian Obliviator <laughs> part. The rest was like, yeah, fine. <laughs> All right, yeah, so you're right. Yeah. We've seen We've seen other death touchy things. I just mentioned a, a ton of cards that draw things when creatures die. Right. Yeah. All right. So let's talk about the next one, which speaking of, yeah, fine. It's, <laughs> it's Targ Nar, Demon Fang Knoll. Uh, red and a green for a 2-2 legendary Knoll. This is an uncommon as well. It has pack tactics, which means whenever Targnar, Demon Fang Knoll, attacks, if you attacked with creatures with total power 6 or greater this combat, attacking creatures get plus 1, plus 0 until end of turn. So if you just attack with a total of 6 power or more, they all get pumped by 1. Uh, and then you can pay 2, a red and a green, to double Targnar's power and toughness until end of turn. Again, it is a 2-mana two 2-2. Two -two. So it'll become a 3-2 if you attack with 6 power more, and then you could pay 4 mana and make it a 6-2. No, no, sorry, a 6-4. Six, four. Six, four. Yeah. But you could do it again, too, and make it a 12. Sure, for 8 eight. mana, you could make it a 12-8. And then one more gets you sure. the commander damage. <laughs> sure, yep. For 12 mana, you could KO somebody. I won't call that out of nowhere, because if you've got 12 mana open, they saw it coming. <laughs> I know, right? Um, okay. It's yeah. aggressive. It comes. It's a 2-drop. It helps attack and it facilitates more attacks. Sure. Josh is like, <laughs> it's really expensive to activate. That's a lot of mana. I know why they had to do it because for limited and stuff, but this is just like too much. It has no evasion. It doesn't have trample, so they can just chump it. Yep. So we're talking like a two mana two two that maybe becomes a three three if you have other th or sorry a three two if you have other things going on. I mean, extra combat steps I guess are good with it because you get the plus one plus zero multiple times. Mm -hmm. So Morag. Uh, Port Razor. There's a card I've been seeing a lot lately. That card is For good. For sure. Yeah, that yeah. card's really good. Um, Aggravated Assault plus Savage Vent Ma. Of course, that's already a combo and you don't need Targnar to help you with that, but it could go in this deck because you're in Gruul. I don't know. Maybe Power Matters stuff. You ha you put Goreclaw down. Who cares about four power creatures? Xenagos doubles power of stuff already. Yep. So maybe we activate before combat, then Xenagos doubles again. Yeah, things that basically give Grant Trample so that you have a better time of it. Look, if we can pump the power on this, then it makes the activated ability that much better. But you, you know? can just do that for any creature. And, you know, there's so many better ways to double a creature's power for, for less than four mana. The, like Berserk, Team or Battle Rage, Unleash Fury. Like, these already do that for way less mana. And mana matters a lot when you're trying to do this because you want to do it a couple of times and... Mm -hmm. Yeah, I uh, I don't think this is... This is like the most basic, like, big attacky creature you can think of. I'm just not excited by it. Are you excited by it, DJ? No, I'm not excited by it because I want my attacky creatures to do more than just, like, attack. I want them to keep me in the game or... And I want Help them... Or, come back or when I get... Or be evasive or be protected or something like that. Um, you know, so, yeah, I'm not, I'm not super excited by it. Okay. Let's uh, let's move on, boy. I forgot the back of this chair is like higher, so when I throw it behind <laughs> me, it just hits the back of the chair and sits on my neck. Okay, uh, let's talk about one of the biggest names in Dungeons and Dragons. Here, this is the it's like the Dragon God or something. Tiamat. Yeah. Tiamat, two 
white, blue, black, red, green. Tuberg. Tuberg. Seven mana. Love it. Uh, <laughs> no, Tuberg would be progenitus. Two, yeah. yeah. Right. So, uh, but it is still seven mana value for a seven, seven legendary creature, Dragon God. It has flying, and when Tiamat enters the battlefield, if you cast it, search your library for up to five dragon cards that not named Tiamat that each have different names. Reveal them, put them into your hand, then shuffle. So just go get five dragons from your deck. We're playing commander, so they won't have the same name, so we don't have to worry about that part. So seven mana, seven, seven, flying. Draw five. Draw five. Yeah. Five, tutor five, you know, sort of. That's awesome. Not tutor any five, but you you know, it's better than draw five. That's great. Uh, I love that it says if you cast it, not cast it from your hand. You just have to cast it. So yeah, you, you just have to cast into this sucker yeah. somehow. That'd be cool. Cool. Okay. So it's a dragon tribal deck. Yeah, because you need at least five dragons, right? Right. Like, you need more than that. And so, if you already are having a bunch of dragons in your deck, then you should probably have the dragons that synergize together. Let's talk about some of the best dragons uh, in the deck. This is a cool one, Hellkite Courser. I, 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 I haven't seen this card in play a lot, but every time I have, it's been really good. Um, it's four red red for a six five flyer. When it ETBs, you may put your com- the, you may put a commander you own from the command zone onto the battlefield. It gains haste. Return it to the command zone at the beginning of the next end step. So this will give you one attack with teammate, but more importantly, you get that trigger. It's not cast. You may put right. Yeah, it's put. Oh, you have to cast. Yes. Oh. So you won't be able to oh. get the trigger. Oh. Do you want to just rewind all the way back? <laughs> no, that's okay. We don't have to rewind. <laughs> I was excited and I'm less excited now because you have to cast Emet, which it's we still literally a seven, seven. we literally just said before. <laughs> <laughs> it's still a seven seven. That's reading the card cool. explains the card. Everybody. Okay. Well, sure. I think Hellkite Courser. Uh, hmm. Josh says cut it. It's no. It's just less good. <laughs> Sneak attack's just way better then, because then at least you can play out the five cards you get with Tiamat. Sneak attack doesn't have you cast it, doesn't it just put no, you No, no, Tiamat, that? you cast, you get five dragons. Oh, got in your it. Hand. Yes, now yes, you have yes, five yes. dragons in your hand to, to, to deploy with Sneak Absolutely, attack. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Whereas Hellcat Courser only gets your commander out of the command zone, so it can't even be used to get like another dragon you have in your hand out. Yes, right? that is true. So, like, okay, Hellcat Courser, I, <sighs> that's too bad, but it's not that great with Tiamat. Um, unless you just want to hit him for seven, which doesn't seem worth it. But sneak attack. I'm just pivoting. We're just imagining. We're going, to, going into sneak attack. Sneak, okay. But uh, what are some other dragons we might want to put in there? There's um, dragons that sort of help you cast Tiamat or help you cast the cards you get with Tiamat. Yeah. So I really thought that, uh, for example, a Belladros Witherbloom oh, yeah. would be a really good one. It's a uh, five black green for a four, four legendary elder dragon with flying. And at the beginning of each upkeep, you can create a one, one black and green pest creature token. When it dies, you gain a life. But more importantly, you can pay 10 life and untap all lands you control. Activate this only once each turn. So you can play this and it can sort of untap your lands to help you cast bigger things like Tiamat. Yep. But also like if you get this from Tiamat, you can play this and then pay 10 life on tap everything and then cast another dragon or another two dragons. And so it kind of casts itself for free. And when, you know, you're going to be flooded with big dragons, you know, you're yep. not going to have enough mana to deploy everything outside something like sneak attack. And so you might need ways to generate more mana. Or even, it's really good with Sneak Attack, because you play Belladros, then the next turn, play Tiamat, untap all your stuff. Now you have the mana to activate the Sneak Attack, get all the five dragons into play. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, Belladros, I mean, I've played against Belladros a few, great. T- few times now, and that card is scary. One activation of untap all your lands often wins the game. Uh, Goldspan Dragon, we've talked about it a couple times, but it's also good in this deck. It makes it so when you sack a treasure, that it creates two mana instead of one, and this is going to be a mana-hungry deck, because dragons decks always are. Dragons are just high mana value, high mm-hmm. CMC. So that's another cool dragon you might want to get with Tiamat the first time. Um, or you can curve into it, because it's it's not yeah, a seven play drop. It before. You play it before, you get the treasure, and this kind of ramps you into Tiamat, and then maybe lets you deploy something afterwards. And it makes treasure, treasure every time it attacks, so yeah. it's kind of ramping you there. There's a good chance when playing Tiamat that you will have to discard some cards. So you cast Tiamat, you put five dragons into hand. There's a good chance at that point you have more than seven cards. So I think like a bunch of dragons in your deck will want to be in the graveyard or you just need to design the deck knowing that, oh, I'm going to discard cards and that could be really good for me. So something like Bladewing the Risen, Mm. which is a a dragon, is a 4-4 for seven mana. But when it enters the battlefield, you can return a dragon permanent card from your graveyard to the battlefield. And it has an activated ability for a red and a black to... Uh, give all your dragons plus one plus one until end of turn. So blade wing can become this way to sort of get your stuff back that you've discarded. Uh, but that's pretty expensive. Seven mana. I would often like to play one or two. So yeah. animate dead 
reanimate, um, uh, necromancy. These are all ways to get creatures out of your graveyard into play for a lot cheaper. Sometimes there, there's usually a little downside, like you take some damage or the creature's one power less. Huge downside. We're fine with that. Yeah, so... they're dragons. Yeah, exactly. Um, Patriarch's bidding is an interesting one. It's a sorcery. Each player chooses a creature type. Each player returns all creature cards of a type chosen this way from their graveyard to the battlefield. It's a symmetrical effect, and people are sometimes scared of that symmetrical effect, but honestly, it's great. You're going to get four dragons back, and they're going to be like... Um, the golem yeah. solemn simulacrum back onto the battlefield yeah, yeah they're not tribal it's usually hard to get more than you know one or two creatures usually just you know incidentally maybe you have two that share a type but you know you're getting everything back from your graveyard so that's pretty cool and they're dragons yeah it seems this team it seems set up for world gorger combo mm-hmm. so world gorger dragon here we go three red 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 for a seven seven flying trample dragon when it enters the battlefield exile all other permanents you control and then when world Gorger leaves the battlefield, return the exile cards to the battlefield under their owner's control. So the way this combo generally works is you use Animate Dead or uh, Necromancy. What's the other one? Uh, Dance of the Dead. Okay. An enchantment that brings back uh, the World Gorger Dragon. Right. So let's say it's Animate Dead because it's two mana. Brings World Gorger Dragon into play. When it ETBs, it says, well, exile all other permanents you control. That exiles the Animate Dead. The Animate Dead says, oh, World Gorger Dragon doesn't have a thing holding it on the battlefield anymore. It's supposed to go back to the graveyard. Well, Animate Dead comes back with all your other stuff. And Animate Dead says, I need to animate something. I'll target my World Gorger Dragon. But before it comes in, I'm going to tap all my mana and float that mana. Now World Gorger comes in, exiles all your stuff. Goes away. A- animate dead. You see how this is going to work? You're going to get infinite mana. Also, if Tiamat's out, every time it enters the battlefield again, you're going to draw the five dragons into your hand. Cast? Oh, yeah, it's cast. Dang it. Cast. Doesn't matter, though. World it doesn't Gorger- matter. There's tons of dragons yeah. that do crazy stuff. G- World Gorger gives you infinite mana, and now, eventually, at the end of that, when you've decided you've got enough mana. You actually do, because if you have infinite mana, if this changes zones anywhere, you just put it back oh, in the command zone. Right, yeah. So you yeah. put, yeah. So you will. you can get five extra dragons at the end. And you can also just, like, cast the Animate Dead onto another dragon. That's it's The like way you it, stop yeah. the World Gorger combo is eventually you say, I have enough floating mana and whatever else has happened. Uh, now my Animate Dead, when it comes back, is going to target this other dragon in my graveyard so that World Gorger doesn't come back out and we can stop this loop. And then at that point, you're like, infinite mana, Tiamat, cast it again, get five more dragons, cast those dragons, uh, probably do a million other things because yeah. you have infinite mana and you can usually win the game. Then, win the game. Yeah. You were going to play Karthus, who gives all your dragons haste, or like Teamer Ascendancy, something like that. Um, yeah. So th- I think that's probably the combo version of the deck. And it seems yeah. pretty strong because you can t- tutor for the the main combo piece and then there are redundancy for the other pieces. Plus you're in black and, li- and white and light and tutor to find the anime dead. So it's not going to be hard. Totally. Easy. And then also it, one thing that you mentioned is it kind of gives you that discard outlet too. Yeah. It's the tutor and the discard outlet. It's almost like the entomb on there. It's awesome. You mentioned we were talking about this though. It is a little bit like iffy in that the discard outlet is discarding to hand size. So that's <laughs> yeah. like, hey, I got to go to my discard phase, my cleanup step, and then I'm discarding three cards and one of them is World Gorger Dragon. And everyone's going to be like, whoa, we have to do something about that. Either yeah. kill the person or get rid of that because they're they're going to know. Nobody puts World Gorger Dragon in their deck unless they're going to combo with it. No one plays it fairly at all. So it's like just showing the combo to the whole table yeah. and being like, I hope I get to untap. <laughs> You, yeah, playing it fairly, just like everything's exiled. You have no, no lands, no nothing. You're just like, well, I hope this 7-7 seven, seven gets there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, and then uh, we put down some interesting things with Tiamat where you can play some non-dragons like Morophon, Maskwood Nexus, Conspiracy to turn your uh, non-dragon creatures in the deck into dragons so you I, can tutor them. Yeah, I always like it when there's uh, something that's not a creature that can have shapeshifters, so like yeah. Crypt Swap. I like that one a lot. It's a removal spell that's technically a dragon, so that's like a cute corner case thing. Yep. Yeah. All right. Team it seems fairly powerful and it's a cool dragon deck. Is it going to be better than Ur-Dragon? I bet <sighs> it is. Ur-Dragon reducing the casting cost oh, of dragons is so, is yeah. so, so good. But here's the thing. I think that Ur- Ur dragon is more of an attacking like curve out uh, dragon deck, and this is more of a like late game huge value dragon deck. You know, regardless, sign of the Ur dragon is almost certainly better than both of them. Yeah, sorry. Okay, let's go on to the next. We're getting near the end here. I think we've only got a few to go. Yeah, 
You want to read it? Sure. We have Trollosara, Moon Dancer. Yeah, just say it with confidence and then I don't I know, know. right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just... Green and a white for a 2 2 legendary creature elf cleric. Whenever you gain life, put a plus one plus one counter on Trellisara, Moon Dancer, and scry one. So this is another one of the uncommon legendary creatures from the set. Trellisara is a green white life gain matters deck. I think that shell we kind of know, so it's not super important. I would just say to people that like there are kind of two kinds of life gain, right? Ones that want you to gain a, a lot of life all at once. A big thing of life, a big chunk. Yeah, this is not that. This is more of the, uh, we want little incremental amounts of life often. Because every time you gain life, you get a 1-1 counter. So if you gain 10 life at a time, you get a 1-1 counter. So the Soul Sisters are kind of the first thing everybody thinks of. These are all these one mana creatures that say some version of whenever another creature enters the battlefield, you gain one life. Mm -hmm. So that means anytime anybody puts out a creature, you gain a life and Trellisar starts growing. But we've seen the Soul Sisters really interact well with decks that already exist like that. Like we've seen a Johnny's Pride Mate, yep. which is just a two mana 2-2 two -two that also grows whenever you gain life. And it's just this thing that you would see in like draft right right but we've seen it grow huge and be a real threat in commander like i've seen people play a johnny's pride mates and then gain little bits of life here and there and it's just like oh my gosh we have to deal with this pride mate now so i can see that that being even more threatening on your commander sure but i mean we have like a shy and stuff in our format which is just going to grow with every spell people cast and stuff yeah, like that you're right and like trail star is just like on the ground starts <laughs> and smaller and has more hoops to jump through listen the only interesting thing about this to me is that most life gain decks up till this point have been uh white and black and there's only a few that are green and white so it opens up a few of the green cards maybe that weren't usable before but mm -hmm. yeah doesn't seem like it's going to be super good there's not a lot to say about it anyway they like gain life have fun Grow yeah. Trellisara. Game on a little bit. Yeah. Uh, all right. We got two to go. The next one is Volo, Guide to Monsters. Two green blue for a 3-2 human wizard. Legendary, of course. Whenever you cast a creature spell that doesn't share a creature type with a creature you control or a creature card in your graveyard, copy that spell. A copy of a creature spell becomes a token. Uh, so. The non the non tribal deck Yes, this is anti-tribal, right? Like, Volo does not want to talk about creatures that it already knows about. Only wants new ones that he's never seen before. Like, have you seen this creature on my battlefield? Nah, never mind. But yeah. New oh, one. yeah, I've yeah. seen that before. But what's yeah. that over there? So, Volo is a human wizard, and you put down in the notes very smartly that. So, that immediately means you can never, not never, but it's difficult to copy a human or and or wizard that's a lot of cards by the way yeah <laughs> a lot of the cards you immediately go that would be good are like nope it's a human or a wizard so let's say you cast a wolf that's going to make two wolves when it comes in right but if you cast a wolf after that it will just make one wolf it won't make the copy because it says there's a wolf also if the wolf dies and is in your graveyard still yeah. still looks at it in the graveyard it has For to be sure. exiled or bounced or something so I think you're probably going to want to build this deck so that like most things don't share a type with anything else. Yeah, I think that you can double up. It's totally fine to do that. But I think that a lot of people that build this are going to be like, no, no overlap whatsoever. And that's going to be a fun deck building restriction for them. Yeah, I think you can, but you want to be careful also because it's going to be easy to get confused. Um, <laughs> so let's talk about some of the creatures that might go in a Volo deck. I think Evoke is really, really good because you still cast the creature. So if you evoke a Mole Drifter, you're going to end up with a 2-2 two -two and draw 4. It's great. Because it'll die. Um, Wave Sifter is another one, although they're both elementals, so choose one or the other. <gasps> You'd choose Mole Drifter. Ether Snipe is another <laughs> one with evoke. That's an elemental too. Yeah, that's an elemental. This is where you might want to be able to have two of the same thing. Ether yeah. Snipe's really good, right? It's a 6-mana 4-4 four four that bounces a creature, a non-land permanent when it ETBs, but it has evoke for 1 blue-blue. So if you evoke it one blue blue, you'll get the four four and bounce two things. It's great. That's three mana four four bounce two things. That seems really really good. We talked about Cloud Thresher earlier, also in an elemental. So maybe don't play all of these. But again, if you evoke it, you get a seven seven flash reach, and you deal four damage to each player and all creatures with flying. <laughs> it's pretty great. Yeah, it's like super good. So you probably ambush a flyer and kill all the rest of the flyers, right? Oh my gosh, it's great. Yeah. Um, so I was I was trying to think of like, okay, because whenever you double up stuff like this, you can always sort of combo and do crazy things. So one of the two of the best cards I think you can get are like Peregrine Drake or Palancron, right? So they ETB and untap 10 lands. Yeah. So you just float the mana. So you actually get up lands or, or Palancron untaps, what, seven? Um, yeah. Is seven or eight? Whatever it is, it's, it's almost always infinite when you see a Palancron. Uh, and Palancron will immediately go, 
infinite if you can get rid of the token. Yeah. So if you have a sack outlet to get rid of the token, you can have enough mana to bounce it back to your hand and play it again. And, and then Volo lands twice. We'll be able to say like, oh, you know, because the token's gone forever. It's not in your graveyard. It's not on the battlefield. If it's just gone, Volo will then make another copy of it. And I think you'll want tokens in your, or sorry, uh, sacrifice outlets in your deck for this reason. Mm -hmm. and a lot of bounce. I think Mana War is probably really good in the deck. Mist Raven, the ETB bounce two things. Some of it can be your own stuff. What's the creature type on Mana War? Mana War is a jellyfish. Not very many jellyfishes. Right. You don't have to worry about that one. Shout out to Marshall Sutcliffe there. <laughs> Mist Raven is a bird. Uh, and you could probably get with Peregrine Drake in, in a sack outlet into infinite mana loops there. Oh, yeah. If you want to. So I think those are really good. Uh, and then I was thinking, are there ways around this uh, this clause about not sharing a creature type with anything on the battlefield or the graveyard. And it turns out there are some cards that will alter the creature types on your cards so you could like take away the creature type they have so you could cast two elementals or whatever if you wanted to. Okay. So um, let's start with unnatural selection. One in a blue for an enchantment, but you can pay one and you choose a creature type other than wall. Target creature's type becomes that type until end of turn. This one will work. Because it doesn't, it doesn't say they keep in addition to the other types. Whenever you cast a creature spell that doesn't share a type with a creature you control, so doesn't doesn't this thing trigger on the stack so that you can't target the? Thing no, you the do stack? this. You turn the thing into it before. So you go. I'm going to cast uh, an elemental. So before I do that, I'm going to turn my Moldridge for that's on the battlefield Got it. into so, a giant. So it has to be on the battlefield. It can't be in the graveyard. Right. Because yeah. in the graveyard, it doesn't mm -hmm. work. Yeah. But if it's on the battlefield, you can have it work. Yeah. Just give me this one, okay? <laughs> um, yeah. This is feeling like a worse and worse idea. Does it say of a creature card in your... Okay, good. This next one is Ego Erasure. <laughs> Two in a blue. Listen, I went off the rails a little. <laughs> it's good For a good. tribal instant with Changeling. But it's an instant, so that does, Changeling thing doesn't matter. Creatures, target player controls, get negative 2, negative 0, and lose all creature types until end of turn. Nice, okay. So you cast that, all your creatures lose creature type. They're all smaller too. Uh, and then you can, you know, cast your either Snipe of Fear, Mold Drifters out. And you actually check that one because it says like, Creature, Creatures, you're yeah. like, oh, does it say creature card in your graveyard? And it, it does. So that one won't be a changeling in your graveyard messing everything up. Anyway, I think Volo's kind of cool. I like the restriction on it, which makes it a little bit complicated. Um, I like it too. I like being able to search through and be like, well, what do I want in my copy deck and my, you know, deck right. like that? And then you're like, oh, I can't have that. Okay. And then you're, I actually started making like a spreadsheet <laughs> to try and figure out <laughs> like what the what? best, what the best one is of each. It's Mold Drifter. Yeah. That's the best card. Dude, your Always elementals sound card. great. Yeah. There's That's, so many though. I know. There's so many you want to play. What I think sucks is if one of them dies and you're like, crap, because now it's really hard to interact with and that. And one will die because you're going to evoke it. Dang it. That's true. I need to... But it's so good. It is I honestly need the so Elixir good. of Immortality to like shuffle those back in so I can do it again. I don't know. I'm, I'm excited about Volo, but it is harder than it looks. Oh, one thing I wanted to mention, uh, because we got this wrong in a past set review, um, Parallel Lives Doubling Season does not work with these... Uh, when you copy a spell that's a permanent. It won't make... a uh, extra copy of the token. I forget why the rules are that way, but you can go online and a lot of people pointed that out to us. And so don't put parallel lives and doubling season into your Volo deck unless you're casting a card that's making tokens, but not because you won't get three mole drifters if parallel lives is out um, when because of Volo. It doesn't work that way. Huh. I yeah. wouldn't uh, honestly. I don't. I don't think I would have thought of that. I think I would have. I think I would have needed someone like you to talk to some other judge person to be able to tell me that. You need someone like me who got <laughs> yelled at by a whole bunch of people for saying it wrong, that then looked it up and found out and forgot why. But that's how we know it works. Okay. Is it because it was a cast thing that it was created it's, on the stack or something like that? Yeah, they don't basically. It's like they don't want it to work that way, so it doesn't work that ah. way. Kind of like that's what that's what I got from it. Okay, we got one more creature go. It's one of the most famous, also in D and D. It's a beholder. It's Xanathar Guild Kingpin for a blue and a black for a 5-6 legendary creature, Beholder. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. At the beginning of your upkeep, choose target opponent until end of turn. That player can't cast spells. You may look at the top card of their library at any time, and you may play the top card of their library, and you may spend mana as though it were mana of any color to cast spells this way. Okay, so you pick another player at the beginning of your upkeep. Yeah, my upkeep, I choose you. So I can't cast spells. You can't cast spells. For and then, the whole turn. Exactly, and then I can just start looking at the top of your library anytime you I want You future sight the top of my library. Yeah, anytime I want, I'm just like, oh, look at the top card of your library. And you can cast that stuff without paying its mana cost. Uh, no, I have to pay the mana cost. Oh, sorry, with 
using mana as a man of any color. Yes, I can use mana without uh, mana cost. Would be yeah, broken. Yeah. Oh, so I see this as like a fixed or fair send triplets, right? Send triplets. The idea behind it was good, but the fact that it strips cards out of their hands becomes pretty oppressive because not only are you taking stuff from them, they literally have less resources as you do it, so they stop being able to like fight you. Uh, because you just look at their hand and go, oh, there's a removal spell, I'll cast that. And then they're like, I have now I have no way to kill send triplets. Whereas Xanathar says, I'm going to cast cards from your library. But on your turn, you still have the cards that you had in your hand, and you're still going to draw a card. So you'll still be able to combat what I'm doing. Absolutely. And so it makes it a little bit more fair. It makes it a little bit... Also, it makes it easier to cast stuff. I think that with send triplets, it didn't fix mana at all. So you right. kind of had to have these hoops to be able to fix mana. There Which were, is not there that hard ways, as it There are plenty out. of ways yeah. to do it, for sure. Um, but with this, it's nice to be able to just say, oh, I can cast that. Uh, I also think that people always underestimate how powerful Future Sight is. Uh, this says play, so you can play a land. Yep. And so oftentimes you can chain several spells together. Yeah. And it's also, not just like play their top card, you're done. It's like play their top card. Look at their top card now the new one and be like can i play that yeah play that too oh look at the top card so you can often get like five six things off the top yeah and so it ends up being really powerful and also fun i think it's fun to steal people's cards in this manner it's not actually taking a resource that they have access to right now mm -hmm. so it's not like reducing their board their hand anything like that you're just using the cards they have in their deck i like that because it's hard for them to complain you know like you oh your deck's too powerful i'm playing you with your deck <laughs> right like if you don't can't deal with an ulamog then it's probably your fault you put it in your own deck and i can cast it off the top of your library which means you haven't killed me yet yeah exactly <laughs> uh so i think this is gonna look a lot like a centriplus deck as far as how you build it obviously it's missing a color but here's the good centriplus decks that i've played against are almost all ramp and protection for centriplus mm -hmm. so they go tons and tons of ramp and tons and tons of counter spells and things to stop you from killing it. And then they rely on the opponent's decks for the other pieces, which is like cards that win the game and do stuff. Yeah, you don't need threats if you if I can use your threats. And I don't need card draw because I'm going to draw it off of your deck. Mm -hmm. And so that's... And you want to get... You know, Xanathar is a six drop that does nothing when it comes into play. So you really want to cast it early, hope it survives, and as soon as you untap with it, you're going to be like, I'm going to hold up protection, and I'm just going to use the top of my opponent's decks to do stuff. Um... If you have enough protection too to cast it, to cast it when you have the extra mana for protection, you might be able to get that land drop off of your opponent too. Yeah. Wait, hang on. When you cast it, it does nothing at the beginning of your upkeep. You have to wait yeah, a turn to get to anything. Yep. <sighs> so that does. I I do. I don't like that that you have to wait an entire. Turn. I like it. It's totally fair. Centripetal has to do that too, and that deck is broken. So okay. Yeah. <laughs> like, listen, just give them a little hamper before they start stealing the yeah, top of people's right. decks. Uh, okay, well, let's talk about some interesting things you can do with Xanathar. For one thing, you can get you can target more than one opponent if you have other things going on. So, like, Paradox Haze gives you two upkeeps. Oh, cool. So you're like, DJ, you can't cast spells. I'm going to look at the top of your library this turn. And also, Jimmy, you can't cast spells. I'm going to target. The, I'm going to look at the top of your library this turn. Now that's double your pleasure, double chance of having spells on top, double people that can't mess with you. Hmm. Also, with both the Sakashima, Sakashimas... That's a way to get another trigger because they co they clone, but the legendary rule doesn't count. So you can say this Xanathar targets you, this Xanathar, Xanathar targets you. Uh, I think there's a... Conceivably, you could play all the decks at the table during your turn. That's like, awesome. Like, I'm just going to look at the top of all three of my opponents, and I still have my cards. Because that gives you a lot of... I mean, because I think the key is to be able to have access to as many cards as possible, yep. right? Because there's an easy way to just see... You see that Ulamog, you know what I mean? You're like, I don't have 10, I'm stuck. Right. And then you're, you've done nothing that turn. So having access to a whole nother player so you can go down deep in their deck uh, is great. Or, you know, finding a way to get rid of that Ulamog and keep going deeper in that one player's deck. And don't discount the they can't cast spells during your turn mm -hmm. thing. You want to turn off the ability for them to mess with you. And the more triggers you have, the more players you are sort of muting for your turn, which I think is very powerful. Now, the thing that you run into a future site is that you can keep casting spells off the top until you run out of mana or until there's a land there and you've already played your land drop. And so I think you're going to want some cards that will mill your opponents so that when you look at the top card and it is not, it's either another land or not something, or maybe it's too much mana and you can't cast it, you want to be able to, to mill those yeah, cards get away. get rid of it. Yeah, it's hard to make your opponent shuffle. There are a few cards that do it, but in general, I think it's easier to mill them. So I think cards like Millstone, Altar of the Brood, Co codex shredder is a really good one that just like oh let me let me mill that away so i can look at what the next card is we'll kind of be able to 
let you like keep momentum and keep going through their deck and casting more spells. Yeah. Sir Conrad the Grim has an active oh, ability yeah. that just mills one card and so you can just yeah. get, get past it. Um, could this be like a, a new uh, <laughs> kind of a... Oh, what's the what's the deck that like locks people out that just mills one card and you can see the top card of their lantern library? Lantern control. Could this be like a lantern control type thing? Like you pixis even the top card and Maybe. like you, see that's you keep going it's down. It's tough with so many opponents to reliably be able to do that to everybody. Yeah, uh, to have that. So I don't know if control. it's worth it to do that because then everybody is also going to know. I guess they're going to know when you cast the card off the library what you're doing anyway. So maybe the knowledge is not that important. You could maybe like you could maybe take some aspects of that, but I don't know if you're going to be able to lock everybody down in the same Probably way. not, no. Yeah. I do think this could be like a, a good as like a a mill infinite combo type deck where you're like using your opponent's libraries to like get their wrath spells or their, uh, their single target removal and control the board that way. But your main plan is like get infinite mana or a lot of mana and sort of mill everybody out. Do you know what else is really great too? It's almost like uh, you know the the Jace ability when you when you're mm, able to see yeah, you're able to see the seal. top card, the Fate Seal, because you could just see something on top and you're like, well, I can mill it, but I don't have any mana left. I'm just going to leave that land on top. Yeah, you know I don't care I mean? if they get a can, land. Yeah, and then you can draw the land, and then I can kind of like I'm not even worried about casting it. I'm just sort of setting up your next draw over and over again and having ways to manipulate what you're going to draw on your next turn. Especially if you're doing multiple opponents. You're like, oh, I'm going to stick you with that because that card's no good. And then I'll just And then I don't have to worry about you for a second. I'll go over here and do that. Yeah, totally interesting. You wrote down a card that is pretty funny with this. uh, And this is a card, I'm definitely seeing it more than I thought I would when when we... uh, when we did the set review for M20. I love this card. It's Scheming Symmetry. One black for sorcery. Choose two target players. Each of them searches their library for a card, then shuffles their library and puts that card on top of it. So you cast this on your turn. You get your best card uh, on top of your deck, but then they... Well, they have to search, but like they know... They, they, what do they get? Do they get a so land? Do, they, do you politic? <laughs> you have to politically do it. You have to be like so. Like you could either you can either say, "Look, you're going to get something horrible. I'm not going to do anything," and then you're going to draw it next turn, or or you can do something political. You put a removal spell in there, and I'm going to kill Ashlyn's uh, Gavi Ness Warden or something like this that. This is pretty brutal, and I think you're going to want Vidalcanori and Leyline in this deck because that way you can play Xanthar on the end set before your turn, and it's not sitting there exposed the whole time. Mm-hmm. But if you can see me symmetry, symmetry the end step before your turn, and they don't know, and you're oh like... Oh my gosh, that's so good. Yeah, they're like, well, what are you going to do? Are you going to take my turn? I don't know. What are you going to get? Are you going to get a land or something crappy, or are you going to get something good and hope I don't take your turn? Can you fail to, to find... Take your, yeah, you can fail to find. Can you just like fail to find a card? Like, oh, that's at all? interesting. So you don't have to choose. So then it's random. And then do you have to shuffle? Them I think you can always fail to find. You can always fail to find. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Did but you still have to shuffle even if you fail to find. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. So that could be a shuffle then. So I think you'd never fail to find because then it's a shuffle and then it's anything random on top. Well, it was already random, but yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's an interesting position to put your opponent in. I think, that's I think it's super interesting. All right, that is all of the multicolored commanders from uh, Adventures in the Forgotten Realms, the main set. We're going to have the monocolored commanders to go through in another episode, and then, of course, we are going to talk about all the commander product once that's fully revealed and whatnot. We have a ton of coverage coming up for AFR because we've got all the cards that can go in your 99 from both the main set and uh, from the commander product. We, of course, have all the budget upgrade guides for each of the pre-cons. DJ's been working really, really hard. We're so glad you're here because with just Jimmy and I, all the stuff from Strixhaven and all the extra stuff we've been doing for game nights and things, I don't think it would be possible. So DJ, killing it as always. Make sure you hit the subscribe button so that um, you're notified as all these videos come out if you want to keep up with all the coverage of AFR. There's a ton of really cool mm-hmm. stuff. Uh, before we go, let's talk about, just from the commanders we talked about today, I think we already answered this, but what do you think is the most powerful commander? Um, just it, at its, like if it was built as as optimized as it could be, yeah, we both agree it's Gretchen, right? Gretchen, yeah. yeah. It's Gretchen. It's, it's the Simic one. It's uh, <laughs> Halfling Thrasios. Slightly nerfed Thrasios, <laughs> but still really, really good. Okay, but what is your personal favorite commander of the ones that we talked about today? Uh, I'm in love with Xanathar, the the Beholder. Mm-hmm. I just think it's fun to play off the top of your opponent's deck and play mess with their cards. I kind of like the idea of send triplets, but you're right. It ended up being too mean. It's too oppressive. Uh, and you got a lot of hate, and I couldn't do the fun stuff I wanted to do. So I think that this Beholder is going to unlock that whole strategy for me. Yeah, I think that's going to be a more palatable for the opponents. I do like Xanthar a lot, um, but just to be different, I'm going to say Volo. 
guide, cool. guide to monsters because I think you were like you said the deck building restriction of like I can only really have two or three elementals in my whole deck maybe only two uh, will be fun as you're designing the and thing. do I have a way to exile my graveyard like do I, I have do I have like, to put those in there like, like guys that- blessing and stuff just to <laughs> shuffle that stuff away is that a thing I need to do yeah pretty cool I, I, I may build that deck just to see if the hoops uh, can be jumped through yeah. alright to the listeners what do you what is the commander that you are personally most excited about that we talked about today? What multi multiplayer multicolored commander from the set uh, do you think will be the most powerful or the strongest or the most fun? Please uh, let us know in the comments on Twitter. Any way you correspond with us on our Discord. Um, what sweet tech for that card did uh, did you think of that we didn't even talk about today? We like to see all those comments, uh, and we like for people to be able to go down into the comment section and get ideas that we didn't even come up with. Obviously, we're doing this stuff you know pretty early on in the pro- in the process. So, you know, not everything's been solved about everything yet. Oh, yeah. Always in the comments, people go down and they just find good tech. They're like, this commander, like, these are the cards you need. It's like, ooh. Yeah, so often I'm like, we should have talked about that. I know, I didn't even think of it. Yeah. All right. Uh, If you want to get your hands on the Forgotten Realms cards, either the main set stuff, the pre-cons you can order right now, you want collectors, boosters, bundles, bundles, whatever you want, cardkingdom.com slash command zone is the place to go to order all that stuff because you're going to get those cards anyway. You Listen, you're like DJ and I. You are going to buy the magic <laughs> cards. We know that. You may as well just use our affiliate link, cardkingdom.com slash command zone when you do, so that as added gravy thrown in, you can support the content you enjoy. And when you get that stuff, make sure you put it into an ultra pro eclipse sleeve. Pro gloss is the way to go. Those look really, really sharp. They have that awesome shuffle feel. Put that and play it onto a nice ultra pro play mat. If you're a Dungeons and Dragons fan, now's the time to get your play mats because yeah. they're going to have all your favorite characters and whatnot on the ultra pro play mats. Get your play mats, get your deck boxes, yep. get your sleeves, make everything look awesome because we're going back into game stores and playing with these cards. So let's make everything look real good. And they only print that stuff sort of in a certain window while that set is kind of new. And, and you know, I've waited and it's like, man, I wish I could get some Simic guild sleeves right now. And they can be really hard yeah. to find because Ravnica hasn't been printed in a while. So don't wait. Make sure you get your hands on that stuff. Also, don't forget, we have our Kickstarter going on for our first ever Game Nights deck box. It's a it's a big deck box that can hold two double sleeve commander decks, has a third compartment in the middle. The Kickstarter information is in the show notes below this video. We have a limited amount. We They're keep even it. rarer right now yeah. because so many people at the beginning of the episode paused it and bought this. It is even more limited now than it was before. It's definitely possible (laughs) that there were some available at the start and there are none now, or that there are some now and there won't be any in the next couple of hours because they are definitely selling out fast, faster than we thought. So please go over there, lock in your order uh, if there are any left because you don't want to be the person who's like, I'll do that later, and then you came back and it's gone. Okay. Uh, big thanks to our editing, graphics, and logistics team, which is Lady Danger, Manson Lung, Craig Blanchett, Ashlyn Rose, Alfred Estaka, Josh Murphy, Jake Boss, Patrick Nan, Jordan Pridgen, Archer, Arthur Meadowcroft, Sam Wallow, Grav Galati, and Dan Sheehan. And big thanks to Jeffrey Palmer, who does the living card animations that begin our show and often sit behind us on set here, although this one is Cyclonic Rift, I believe, was done by Sam Waldo. All right, everybody. Thanks for watching. A lot more to come, so we'll see you very, very soon. Bye-bye, everyone. Peace. Thank you for your attention. For further inquiries, send an email to commandcast at rocketjump.com or ask us on Twitter at JF Wong and at Josh Lee Kwai. See you later, alligator. Greetings, humans.